Okay, Chair, we're ready. Good evening. This is the April 16th, 2020 regular meeting of the Santa Cruz City Planning Commission. I want to call the meeting to order. Start by um, giving some background on how we're doing this. I want to thank you all for joining and for your patience and flexibility while we establish safe ways for public participation given the coronavirus. To mitigate the spread of the coronavirus, the City Council Chambers is closed. All commissioners, most of staff, and the public are participating through alternative means. Staff in the Chambers is hosting the meeting uh, and they are practicing social distancing. This meeting is being broadcast live through Comcast on channel 25. Those without Comcast have two live streaming options, including community television, the community television website, which is www.communitytv.org slash watch. Or uh, you can use the live link from the Planning Commission page, www dot city of santa cruz dot com slash pc this live link became available once the meeting started and is located next to where you access the agenda for the meeting again that is at www dot city of santa cruz dot com slash pc you may need to use the Windows Internet Explorer browser in order to, uh, for this link to work. If you don't have a TV or another device that can stream, uh, you will be able to hear the meeting by simply calling in. And here are the, the phone numbers are on the screen. Um, members of the public who wish to comment should call into the phone numbers provided on the Planning Commission agenda website and on the screen here. If a number is busy, please go through the list of options until you enter the meeting. Remember, you will need to enter the meeting ID provided which is available on the agenda. Uh, the number is 497. 604-405, and the webinar ID is also on the screen, uh, if you can see the screen here. Each agenda item will be announced, as will the public comment period for each item, and the public will be able to speak on each item. Those on the phone will be asked to press the star 9 uh, button to raise their hand. Raising your hand allows the clerk to inform me as to who and how many people wish to speak on each item. Prior to beginning public comment for each item, I will allow a few minutes for the public to call into the conference if they are not yet present. It is important to mention while making your comments, if you are watching the meeting live, to mute the stream you are watching Giving, uh, given delay between broadcasting. It takes a while between our speaking and what shows up on um, the, the TV or screen. Instructions for public comment will be announced again at the time of each agenda item. Normally, individual public comments will be limited to three minutes. However, if a greater number, a great number of people want to speak on an item, uh, less time may be allowed. Each speaker will be notified when they have 30 seconds left. If you are having technical problems calling into the meeting, please call 831-420-5245 and a staff member will assist you. We'll now get on with the meeting and uh, ask, the, uh, ask 
ask for a roll call. Commissioner Maxwell? Present. Conway? Here. Commissioner Spellman? Commissioner Spellman? <laughs> Commissioner Dawson? Sorry, right, here. No, thank you. Commissioner Dawson? Here. Nielsen? Present. Greenberg? Here. Chair Schifrin? Uh, here. Um, is there are no absence? Um, we'll move on to statements of disqualification. Does anyone have a statement of disqualification? Yes. Yes, I do. Commissioner Spellman. On the 122 Benito project, I will be uh, recusing myself from that discussion. Okay, thank you. We'll now move to oral communications with those who have called in and wish to speak on items not on this evening's agenda, but within the purview of the Planning Commission, please press star nine now. You only need to press star nine once. I'll wait a few minutes to give additional members of the public time to get on the phone line. If a number is busy, please go through the list of options until you Remember, you will need to enter the meeting ID provided, which is available on the agenda. That ID number is 497-604-405. When it is your turn to speak, a staff member will inform you that your phone line has been unmuted, which is your cue to begin speaking. It is important to mention while making your if you are watching the meeting, you need to mute the live stream you are watching, giving delays between the broadcast. The meeting, the numbers to call are on the screen. Um, again, this is a time to talk about agendas that are not on our agenda tonight, uh, items that are not on our agenda tonight. I want to ask the clerk for the number of people who have asked to speak. Uh, presently, there are none. Okay. Um, I'll give it another minute. So um, I can't see a, um, uh, a minute handle. So will the clerk please tell me when a minute's gone by? Okay, it's been a minute, Chair, and um, I do not see any hands raised to speak at all communication. Okay, seeing that no members of the public wish to speak during oral communication, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is announcements. Does anybody have any announcements? Seeing none, uh, we have no presentations, so we'll move on to the approval of the minutes and um, the, uh, does any member of the commission want to uh, make any changes to the minutes? I'll move to approve the minutes. 
Before we act on that, is there any man, member of the public who would like to speak uh, to the uh, item, the motion to approve the minutes of the March 5th, 2020 meeting? Give a couple of, a few seconds for people to call in. Okay, is there any commission discussion of the minutes? It's been moved by, who moved the minutes? I'm sorry. I believe it was Commissioner I did. Oh, Commissioner it? Neal, who seconded it? I don't have a second. I'll second the motion. Commissioner Spellman, it's been moved and second to approve the minutes of March 5th, 2020. All those in favor say, well, why don't we do a roll call since we can't really know what's going on. I think it would probably be best if we do a roll call on all the motions. Okay. Um, so could we have a roll call? Commissioner Maxwell? Aye. Conway? Aye. Spellman? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Chair Schifrin? Aye. Uh, the minutes are approved. We'll now move to the consent agenda. There are two items on the consent agenda. Uh, one is 238 Carbonara Drive, CP19-0111. That's a slope variance and design permit to construct a single family dwelling on a slope exceeding 30%. I'm not gonna read the whole um, description because the recommendation is, um, staff rec recommends request continuance of this item to the hearing of May 7th with re-noticing to include the permit entitlement of a variance to the project description. The second item on the um, Consent agenda is uh, CP19-037, 122 Benito Avenue, APN 010042-21, uh, a special use permit and design permit to demolish an existing commercial building and construct a new office and warehouse building with two apartment uh, units above on property in the CC Community Commercial Zone District. The recommendation is that the Planning Commission acknowledge the environmental determination and approve the special use permit and design permit with the conditions attached to the staff report dated April 10th, 2020. All the item, both of the items on the consent agenda will be voted on in one motion unless a member of the Planning Commission wishes to put an item on the regular agenda. Um, there, the, uh, or a member of, uh, uh, if, or if a member of the public wishes to speak on either of the consent agenda items, um, that the, the thing to do is to press, press star nine if you wish to speak on one of the consent agenda items to let the clerk know. Uh, again, at this time, uh, we're taking comment for both of the items on the consent agenda. Um, the first one is on uh, 238 Carbonara Drive, and the second one is on 122 Benito Street. I'll wait a minute or so to see if anybody wants to log in and speak. Um, the commission has received correspondence on the 122 Benito uh, Avenue, which I assume everyone has reviewed. Um, I want to remind uh, each anyone who w wishes to speak that they can only uh, that they can only speak once per item. If a number is busy, please go through the list of options until you enter the meeting. Remember, you will need to enter the meeting ID provided, uh, which is provided and available on the agenda. And again, that's 497 
When it is your turn to speak, a staff member will inform you that your phone line has been unmuted, which is your cue to start speaking. So just wait a, uh, another uh, little while to see if there's anyone who wants to speak on an item on the consent agenda. Chair Schifrin, one uh, member of the public has uh, raised their hand to speak to this item. Okay, so when it is your turn to speak, uh, a staff member will uh, inform you and your phone that your phone line has been unmuted, which is your cue to begin speaking. It is important to mention again, while making your comments, if you are watching the meeting live, to mute the live stream you are watching, given delays between broadcasting. The clerk will give you a 30-second warning. You have three, your, your, your comments, you can talk to the, uh, to the, first tell us which item you'd like to speak to, and then you'll have three minutes to talk on the item, and the clerk will give you a 30-second warning when your, uh, a warning when 30 seconds are up, and that would be your, uh, your cue to wrap up your comments. So uh, let me uh, ask the clerk to unmute the speaker and you can begin. Hello, can you hear me? My name is Hannah Nevins and I'm a resident of the adjacent area to the 122 Benito Avenue site. Okay, what was your comment? Um, I would like to make a positive comment that uh, we feel that that's appropriate mixed use in our neighborhood, including housing, which is an important component of our neighborhood area. Um, I would also like to point out that we've had a lot of issues with on-street parking along Benito Avenue in the stretch between Water Street and Soquel and the city has addressed some of that towards the building site, but not the whole thoroughfare, which includes Benito, which originates on Water Street and dog leg around the schoolyard and ends on Soquel Avenue. So I would like that the Planning Commission consider additional parking um, zoning, rezoning in that area so that there's less of an impact in our neighborhood with the addition of houses and businesses at this site. Okay. Thank you, ver thank you very much for your comment. Um, does any commissioner want to pull this item? Seeing no one, um, the only item before us, the, there are only these two items before us. Um, and I will open it up if any of the commissioners want to make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Uh, Commissioner Dawson? Yes, I move um, to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? I'll second. I'll second. That. It's been a, a, a motion has been made and seconded to approve the two items on the consent agenda, that is uh, to continue the item on 238 Carbonara Drive and to approve the special use permit and design permit um, for, the, uh, for the application at 122 Benito Avenue. Is there any further discussion? All, well, we'll have a roll call um, uh, to act on this motion to approve these two items. Commissioner Maxwell? Aye. Conway? Aye. Spellman? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Um, could I just clarify, Commissioner Spellman, you're only voting on the Carbonara Avenue item? I yes, you were, thank you. I thought you would recuse yourself on the Benito Avenue item. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, continue, please. Nielsen? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Commissioner Dawson, did I already record your vote? Yes, it was I. Thank you. Um, and Chair Schifrin? 
All right. So the two items, uh, the staff recommendations on the two items on the con consent agenda are approved. We'll now move on to general business. Um, we only have one item. Oh, well, actually, we have two items. Well, we have one item of general business and one item on information items. Um, let me go through the process for the public hearing. Uh, I will announce the item. The staff will make a staff report uh, and answer commissioner questions. There will be time for an applicant uh, presentation. There will be time for public comment. And um, um, uh, I understand that there will be one 10-minute presentation by, um, uh, that's been requested in advance. And after that, the advisory group will, our group, I'm sorry, I'm reading here, the, the commission will deliberate and action. The commission can, will ask questions after, um, after the staff report. Um, and before public comment, if there are any comment, uh, questions on the staff report. Since we are presenting today under different circumstances, we ask for everyone's patience during the applicant's presentation, as well as pre presentations from any organized group, groups and those from the public who have coordinated with us in advance. Staff in the chambers will be controlling the slideshows for the presenters. Public comment will be announced, and we will allow a few moments to make sure all are on the phone for public comment and for the clerk to tally the number of people who wish to speak. Again, you will be informed that the phone line has been unmuted when it's sure, uh, which is your cue to begin speaking. If a number is busy, busy, again, please go through the list of options until you enter the meeting, and remember to uh, enter the meeting ID uh, uh, the number being 497-604-405. It's important to remember that while making your comments that you mute um, your, you mute your um, speaker, uh, mute the live stream. Remember, each person will be able to speak. Everyone will be able to speak who wants to. The clerk will give you a 30-second warning when only 30 seconds of your time remains. This is your cue to wrap up. Everyone who wishes to comment will have an opportunity to do so. However, if there is a, uh, a very, very large number of people who want to speak, um, it may be necessary to reduce the uh, time for each speaker, individual speaker, uh, to less than three minutes. Otherwise, um, my intention is that uh, everyone can have three minutes. So the item before us on general business is CP190029, um, APN0415101. Two alternative proposals to subdivide a 1.62 acre property zoned R1, single family residence, uh, one residential slash commercial development demolition authorization permit to demolish a church and a tentative map to subdivide the parcel into 12 single-family lots. And the second option is a residential commercial, de commercial demolition authorization permit to demolish a church and a planned development permit, design permit, and tentative map to subdivide the parcel into 16 lots consisting of single-family parcels and six condominium units. Uh, the environmental determination is a categorical exemption. Uh, the owner is Circle of Friends, uh, community LLC applicant. Um, it was Parker filed uh, February 19, 2019. So at this time, I'll ask for a staff report on this item. Thank you, Chair Schifrin. Uh, Sarah, if you could stop the screen sharing on your side, then Ryan will attempt to share his screen here. Hey, good evening. This is uh, Senior Planner Ryan Bain uh, presenting for the 111 Eret Circle Project. And okay, go ahead. All right. There we go. 
Can everyone see it? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so on, as I mentioned, uh, this is a project at 111 Eric Circle. Um, to fami familiarize ourselves with the location, um, it's, it's a 1.62 acre circular parcel located at the center of the Garfield Park Circles neighborhood on the west side of Santa Cruz. Um, property contains a, a U-shaped church building on a circular parcel, as you can see here. Um, the church was constructed um, between the years of uh, 1958 and 61. And as you can see, the site is, is surrounded primarily by single family residential uses. Um, there is one local market convenience store uh, adjacent to the parcel to the southwest. So just to give a little background, um, uh, this application has been in the process for quite a while. Uh, actually, even before the application was formally submitted, um, the applicants um, had a community outreach meeting in December of 2018. Um, also, through the summer of 2019, uh, they held weekly meetings at the site um, for interested neighbors to come and, and learn more about the project and talk uh, about the project. Um, several neighbors did express concern with the project, specifically the demolition of the church. Um, some felt has historic significance and should be added to the city's historic building survey. Uh, historic evaluation was prepared. Um, by a city approved historic consultant that determined that the property does not meet the criteria for historic listing. In addition, uh, the city had a peer review done of that report um, by our city consultant, Dudek, who agreed that the property does not meet that criteria. Um, in response to uh, concerned citizens um, and neighbors, the, the city council directed staff to refer that historic report um, to the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, for review and to make a formal recommendation to the council as to whether the site should be listed um, as a historic building on the historic building survey or as a historic landmark. Uh, on January 30th, um, the Historic Preservation Commission did hold a hearing to consider that report, uh, historic report, and the commission recommended the city council on a 501 vote that the property uh, not be listed on the city historic building survey. Um, with some additional advisory recommendations um, regarding this pending project that I'll get to a little bit later in my presentation. Um, on February 25th, the City Council held a, held a hearing to consider whether the property should be listed on the Historic Building Survey, and the Council, after hearing testimony, uh, voted and uh, upheld the recommendation of the HPC to not list the property, uh, as well as support the additional recommendations proposed by the HPC. So the proposed project um, originally consisted of two alternatives um, that involved demolition, both involved demolition of the existing church and subdividing the 1.62 acre site. Alternative one, um, the original proposal and alternative preferred by the applicants um, consists of subdividing the parcel into 12 individual single family parcels surrounding a common ownership parcel in the center. Um, this option requires a non-residential demolition authorization permit to demolish the church as well as a tentative map to subdivide the parcel into 13 lots, 12 single family, and then the one um, common ownership parcel. Um, individual property owners would develop each lot separately with a single family home following uh, the approval. Alternative two um, was developed by the applicants in response to earlier early discussions with the planning department. Um, with recommendations to try and maximize the density on the site consistent with uh, certain general plan policies. Um, pursuant, pursuant to the L low density residential general plan designation, a maximum of 16 units can be constructed on the property. Uh, alternative two, um, the alternative preferred by the planning department, consists of subdividing the parcel into 10 individual single family parcels in one lot with single uh, with six condominium units and four ADUs, all surrounding a common ownership parcel in the center. Uh, this option requires, uh, again, a non-residential demolition authorization permit to demolish the church, um, as well as a tentative map. And then, in addition, it would require a planned development permit to allow that multi-use, uh, multi-family use in the R15 zone district, um, as well as uh, variations to lot size, lot width, and setback reductions. Uh, design permits also required for the multiple family uh, structure. So after, after the public notices were published, the applicants withdrew this option from their proposal. 
but staff continues to, to believe that alternative two is more in keeping with the general plan policies aimed at promoting the maximum densities, uh, while social diversity and sustainability. As I mentioned, the general plan designation is L for low density residential. Um, this designation allows for a density range of 1.1 to 10 dwelling units per acre, which based on the 1.62 acre site would allow a range of two to 16 units on the parcel. Uh, therefore, both alternatives are consistent with this uh, designation. So while both alternatives are consistent um, with the residential density called for in the L designation, um, further general plan policies encourage maximizing density at the high end of the general plan designation. Um, here are a few examples. Um, policy LU 3.7 encourages higher intensity residential uses and maximum densities. Uh, 371 allow and encourage development that meets the high end of the general plan land use designation density. Um, LU 3.1 foster land use patterns that balance economic housing community and environmental needs and promote social diversity. The housing element um, speaks to it and by saying clustering of units through the plan development process is encouraged to facilitate projects being built at the higher end of the allowable density. And um, our mo mobility goal M1 talks about land use patterns, street design, parking, and access solutions that facilitate multiple transportation options. So these policies really are the basis um, for the Planning and Community Development Department support for Alternative 2 which maximizes density on the site. While alternative one meets the requirements of R15 um, in regards to uh, the proposed single family use, the minimum 5,000 square foot lot sizes, and the minimum 50 foot width, um, because of those development standards, only 12 lots are possible. Um, so alternative two, the project would maximize the density and number of units allowed on the site at 16 and also, it, as part of that, would provide a varied housing type to promote social diversity, uh, encourage a sustainable and healthy lifestyle given the project's bikeable and walkable nature due to its close proximity to commercial uses, um, job centers such as the West Side Industrial Area and downtown, uh, as well as recreational amenities such as Westcliff Drive. Um, the site is also in close proximity to public transit stops, thereby, uh, thereby further promoting sustainable transportation use by, by residents. Going through some of the permits that are involved or uh, as part of this project, as I mentioned, a non-residential demolition authorization permit um, is needed to demolish the church. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we, we went through that process of evaluating the historic aspects and um, going through plan, uh, HPC and city council determined that it's not eligible for listing on the historic building survey or as a, a city landmark. A tentative map is also required for both alternatives. Um, alternative one um, would include subdivision of the project into 12 5,000 square foot single family detached residential lots. Um, also, there would be one uh, 10,686 square foot common area in the middle. Um, alternative two would include subdivision of the, of the site into 10 4,933 square foot single family residential lots and one 10,670 square foot multifamily residential lot to be developed with six condominium, six condominium units and four ADUs. Um, there would be two common ownership lots uh, as part of alternative two, one for uh, the condo project and then um, for the shared um, uh, parcel in the center. So. As part of alternative two, um, as I had mentioned, a plan development permit would be required to be approved. Um, the intent of plan development permits is to allow creative and, and innovative design to meet the public interest and general plan goals um, more readily than through application of conventional zoning regulations. So in this case, uh, alternative two would require a variation to the R1 zoning regulations um, to allow a six unit multiple family condominium development and four ADUs. Um, in addition, other variations include um, permitting the single family lots to be less than 5,000 square feet. Um, they would permit those lots to have a, a width less than 50 feet um, to 49, pretty minimal. 
um, and then also to reduce the front yard setbacks for the single family homes to 15 feet, uh, as well as the front and rear setbacks for the multifamily structures. Uh, I should mention that uh, a study was done looking at the setbacks um, around Eret Circle, uh, and the average uh, front setback is approximately 14 feet 7 inches, I believe. So um, we're supportive of the 15 foot front setback as um, that's a basic development pattern for that for that general area. Um, also required as part of alternative two is a design permit. Um, this is to propose, this is for the construction of the six condominium units as well as the four ADUs. Um, it'll be made up of two separate two-story structures, um, which would also include eight garage spaces. The proposed site design is, is fairly simple, balanced um, with a shared interior driveway that separates the structures. Um, four of the units are oriented towards Eret Circle. Um, Here's a, here's a street view um, with two of the lower floor units having front entry porches facing the street. So they clearly, facing the street, they really um, come across uh, as a single family and they're really not too large um, and have that appearance of single family. Uh, they have a, a simple contemporary architecture um, with sufficient articulation and compatibility um, with the area. Um, architectural features include porches, balconies, uh, dormer windows and belly bands to balance the height and mass of the building. Um, at approximately 25 feet in height, the structures fall within the 30 foot height limit in the R1 single family zone. Um, um, however, setbacks have been reduced to accommodate the structures on the parcel uh, with approximately six foot front yard setbacks and 10 foot uh, rear setbacks. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, um, when the Historic Preservation Commission considered um, the historic designation, uh, they did have a couple of um, design recommendations that they made to the City Council and the City Council agreed with and supported as well. Um, those are that uh, the project design includes some type of open space at the focal point of the Woodrow Avenue view shed. Um, as you can see here, they've included that. Um, the project include historic interpretive plaques and signs. Um, and that the street pattern be retained. So um, the open space measures approximately 43 feet in width at the edge of the sidewalk and narrows to about 15 feet toward the center of the space. Um, it includes a garden area, bocce court, as well as a 12 foot gravel path um, to, to be able to access that center area. Um, in regards to the interpretive plaques, we've included a condition of approval um, that requires that four historic interpretive plaques be displayed around the site for the public to view. Um, the plaques' purpose is to be basically to provide information regarding the history of the Circles neighborhood, uh, including the origins of the concentric design of the area, uh, the original Tabernacle Church, and the historic development of that uh, Garfield Park neighborhood. The design and content of those plaques will be coordinated with the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, design standards. Um, so the general plan also has a variety of policies that support quality design, such as the following that are directly applicable to this project. Um, this is a the subject parcel is very unique in its shape and surroundings. Um, located at the center of this Garfield Park neighborhood, the lot is visually is visually significant with uh, four intersecting streets meeting the Eret Circle Roadway, which encircles the, the site. Um, so we've included design standards um, in the conditions of approval that address the inclusion of front porches, diminish the visual impacts of garages, as well as address proportions and massing of the homes at each of the street terminuses. Looking at the site currently, there are 18 trees on the site, of which nine are identified as heritage trees. Um, the project would result in the removal of 13 on-site trees, most of which are ornamental landscaping. Five of the trees to be removed are heritage trees that are in, in fairly poor condition with severe structural defects that would be removed due to their condition. Um, city regulations require tree replacement for removal of heritage trees. So therefore, 24, 24-inch uh, 24 box replacement trees are proposed. Uh, the city arborist has reviewed the arborist report and, and agrees with the findings. 
um, site improvements. Um, the applicant submitted an improvement plan and conceptual landscape plan that detailed the street improvements and related landscaping. Uh, new curb gutter and sidewalk are proposed um, with a relatively large five foot planting strip located between the gutter and uh, the seven, a seven foot sidewalk. Um, all utilities will be undergrounded and new handicap accessible ramps with crosswalk striping will be incorporated at the various locations um, around the site. Uh, for inclusionary housing, um, the application was deemed complete uh, prior to our current inclusionary ordinance taking effect. Therefore, both alternatives uh, require 15% of the units be made available for sale to low and moderate income households at an affordable ownership cost. Based on that 15% requirement, both alternatives calculate to require mm -hmm. two affordable units. Um, for alternative one, uh, in, in reviewing it, providing two lots as inclusionary is fairly impractical um, as eligible households would likely not be able to afford both the purchase of the inclusionary lot in addition to securing a construction loan to build a house. So given the uncertainty of the sale and development of the two parcels coupled with the fact that and loopies could be leveraged to achieve significantly more than two single family detached units. The payment of in loopies would be a preferred option um, for alternative one. Um, for alternative two, um, an on site option could be accomplished through a for sale deed restriction on two, two bedroom multifamily units coupled with a rental deed restriction on two of the associated ADUs. Um, we've discussed this, and this could be a really good option. Uh, for the city to consider since it does provide four units um, on the site, uh, including two deed restricted rental units. However, the arrangement with a deed restricted purchase and a deed restricted rental included with that purchase is somewhat complicated. So the city is actively pursuing several affordable housing development proposals and contributions to the affordable housing trust fund through in lieu fee payments in the short term could be leveraged to create a, a more affordable units than what could be provided on site. However, there are some timing issues um, with leveraging those funds. Um, therefore, with an accelerated payment, the in-lieu fee option may be preferred over all, for alternative two. Um, discussions are still taking place regarding this um, with the applicants um, and will ultimately be decided um, by the city council and through negotiations with the applicants. Uh, an environmental checklist was prepared um, by uh, Dudek, an environmental consultant that we use on a regular basis to analyze the project and determine consistency with the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, based on the checklist and pursuant to Public Resources Code 21083.3 and State Secret Guideline 15183, uh, no further environmental analysis is required. As it's been determined, the city's general plan uh, 2030 EIR has adequately addressed the issues and there are no impacts peculiar to the project that have been identified. Um, in addition to the above statutory exemptions that I just mentioned, CEQA uh, provides several categorical exemptions uh, which are applicable to categories of projects that, lead to, that the lead agency has determined generally do not pose a risk of significant impacts on the environment. Uh, therefore, the project can also be considered to be exempt from CEQA uh, under a category exemption pursuant to state CEQA guideline 15332 as it's an infill development. Um, there are certain requirements or uh, conditions that under 15332 has to be consistent with the applicable general plan designation uh, and all applicable general plan policies as well as with applicable zoning designation or regulations, which it is. Um, it occurs within city limits on a project site of no more than five acres. This is less than five acres. Um, it has no value as habitat for endangered, rare, or threatened species that's been determined and would not result in any significant effects relating to traffic, noise, air quality, or water quality, and that's all been determined. Also, um, the site is, can be adequately served by all required utilities and public services. So the recommendation um, for the Planning Commission is one, that you acknowledge the environmental determination, and two, um, to mention, while both alternatives are consistent with that L low density residential designation, uh, many of the general plan policies that I mentioned directly support alternative two over alternative one because it maximizes density at the high end of the general plan designation, promotes social diversity by offering lower priced housing options, and achieves a higher degree of sustainability by more efficiently using land 
by providing more housing options in an area where uh, healthier and more environmentally friendly transportation options such as pedestrian, bicycle, and transit are convenient, particularly given the central location of the site and close proximity to various amenities. Um, these policies are the basis for the Community Development Department's support of Alternative 2, uh, and it's recommended that the Planning Commission recommend the Council, recommend to the Council approval of uh, the project consistent with the plans for Alternative 2, subject to the conditions of approval in, a in the attached uh, staff report and based on the findings listed in the staff report. That concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Could you please uh, stop sharing the screen so I can see if any commissioners have questions by a show of hands? Commissioner Nielsen, I saw you first. Am I out? Okay. Um, so uh, my first question um, goes back to the general plan um, that you, the item that you, or sorry, the, the slide that you pulled up regarding the density. Um, it does say in that um, slide, this, from what I read, it says, uh, that maximizing the density would be encouraged. Um, is that, um, is it encouraged uh, in this case or is it is it required? The wording in the uh, general plan is allow and encourage, I believe. So that is one of those things where um, it doesn't say require but it does say okay. allow and encourage um, to, to, for the higher densities. And so that's, that's why Alternative 2 better uh, succeeds in, in meeting that policy. Um, is it, um, based, on, based on the policies that you bring up, does the, it, um, would, um, would there be any cause for you to deny application um, number one based on those policies? No, I don't. So the so, so application one fits fits fully within um, the policies of the general plan. So this is Lee Butler. I'm the planning director, and yes, um, the project meets the general plan. Um, and I think one of the things that we should both projects meet the general plan. One of the things that I think we should point out here is that the uh, the Housing Accountability Act actually precludes the commission from denying these projects. Um, one of the projects uh, you know, needs to um, get a formal recommendation, um, or I should say one of the projects should get a formal recommendation of approval or some version of one of these projects um, you know, with alternative conditions, however the commission sees fit. However, um, the, uh, the city council then will be bound by the Housing Accountability Act to approve a housing project on this site. And so um, both uh, do meet the general plan um, and it is um, our recommendation based on the variety of uh, the goals and policies that are identified in the um, the general plan that Ryan spoke to, that it's alternative to. But yes, both of them can meet the general plan, and one of them um, should get a, a recommendation from approval, for approval from the Planning Commission based on consistency uh, with the general plan and the applicable zoning criteria and pursuant to the Housing Accountability Act. Okay. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, another question I have um, relates to the 15-foot um, setback um, that um, that was brought up. Um, is that uh, is that setback um, um, considered for both applications, or is that only for application number two? The it's only for application or alternative two, um, because basically. Um, it's allowed through that plan development permit as a variation to development standards. Uh, that okay. being said, with alternative one, um, you might recall that 
in our zoning ordinance, we do allow for um, front yard averaging in mm -hmm. the zoning code. And so alternative one could reduce those front setbacks based on that front yard averaging section of the ordinance. So um, regardless, one way or the other, those, those front yards could be reduced to 15 feet just uh, through different, um, different routes. Is that, would that need to be established now or is that during the building permit application process? For alternative one, it would be done at the building permit um, process time. Okay. 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 Thank you. That's, that, those are my questions for the moment. Thank you. Commissioner Spellman, you were next. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. So one is relating to the inclusionary housing question. And I'm interested in understanding further two things. One, could you elaborate on why you believe the in lieu fee is the right option for this project? And two, given, I guess, our current economic climate, what is the viability of our current uh, in lieu status? I understand potentially putting the money into the affordable housing fund as part of a different project that would uh, theoretically garner more units than we would be able to get on site. I, I support that concept, but I'm, I'm questioning what is the viability of that project currently? Do we have a timeline for when those units would actually come online? So you can elaborate on that, that would be helpful. This is Jessica De DeWitt, I'm with the Housing Department. Um, so trying to answer both your questions. Uh, so the first question is the in lieu fee. Um, what could we do with the in lieu fee? Why do we prefer the oh, Okay, so why are we preferring the in lieu fee? Uh, so, so the state is putting out a NOFA in the next month, at least the latest feedback I got last week was that in the next month they're putting out a NOFA. Notice uh, for funding availability. Yeah, notice for funding availability, thank you. Um, that would allow us to, the city, to show any funds that we have in our trust fund, the state could potentially match them up to $5 million. So we're trying our, our best to, to pull together as much funding as we can to show that it's in the trust fund to be able to double that money that's, that, that we can show that's in the trust fund. Now, I, you know, with the COVID-19 and everything going on, that NOFA could be delayed slightly, but um, as of last week, I was told that it should be coming out at the end of April. Um, so what does that mean as far as when we need to show those funds in our trust fund? Uh, we're looking at most likely latest mid-June mid is when we would probably be getting ready to, to submit for, for the state funds. So I know that timeline is tight, um, but we've looked at our ordinance and there is flexibility as to when a developer can pay the in lieu fee. Um, so our preference would be, you know, if a, if a developer can stand up and pay that fee early, it could double our money, double those in lieu fees, which could then be applied towards projects that we have in the pipeline right now. So I think this is moving to your second question, which was, you know, what's realistic? What do we have going on in our pipeline right now? So in addition to the library site that's floating out there that I'm sure a lot of people have been hearing about, um, we also have the Pacific Station site, and I know that one has been floating out there a little for a little while too, but we, we have recently uh, been able to assemble parcels adjacent to, uh, it's basically the Putney Perry building with the parking lot, uh, the pipeline parking lot, um, or sorry, the pipeline shop. Um, we've been able to assemble that piece of, of property together um, to be able to generate most likely 85 affordable units. Um, we have also applied for Apple Tech funds, so that would be another five million potentially coming in. We should hear about that in the next mm, month-ish, month and a half. Um, so uh, we're, we're basically trying to, 
to get into uh, get a project going right away, and um, this this funding could really help with that. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, my next question is on the density calculations in general for the project, and I noticed that um, so ADUs are not included in density. Could you describe, explain for folks that aren't aware of those conditions why they're not? Sure, so there are a number of things. Um, there are provisions in state law that speak to uh, accessory dwelling units not counting towards density. There are also provisions in our local code and uh, one of those uh, provisions was identified in the, um, the agenda report for the Planning Commission that spoke to uh, a specific general plan policy that um, identifies um, accessory dwelling units as one of the um, housing types. There are a number of housing types that um, do not have the standard density requirements applicable and accessory dwelling units are called out as one of those. Okay, thank you. And my last question has to do with the Housing Accountability Act. And you, you touched on it a little bit. Um, obviously there's some explicit language in that act that forbids the jurisdiction from essentially reducing density for a project. And I couldn't find anything explicit about increasing density for a proposed project. And I'm just wondering about the potential exposure. Do you, do you feel we have a strong standing to be requesting the additional density in relationship to that act? Thanks for raising that question, Commissioner Spellman. The um, you're correct, the Housing Accountability Act does preclude the decision-making bodies from um, reducing densities proposed by applicants or from denying projects proposed by applicants. Those are residential projects, I should say, and residential density. When those projects meet the objective standards of, uh, that are applicable to the particular site. There isn't anything that says um, the, uh, the city cannot require more. There is a provision in the Housing Accountability Act that speaks to um, the act being interpreted in a manner so as to maximize the production of housing. So there are certainly overarching goals in the Housing Accountability Act that speak to the promotion of housing. And so that is something that we took into consideration when making the recommendations. Great, thank you. Other commissioners have questions? I have a question to follow up on um, the Housing Accountability Act uh, issue because my reading of it, and, and the language is in the staff report, seems to be pretty clear. Um, as I understand it, the only application before us is for alternative one. The applicants have withdrawn application, the alternative two application, so that really isn't before us. What that application is the staff recommendation that this would be preferred, but it's not really an application. It's a variant that the staff is recommending. Am I understanding that correctly? What what application is currently before the city? Is there two app are there two applications or is there only one application? So the uh, second alternative is one that the applicants did initially present and have subsequently withdrawn uh, approximately uh, two weeks ago. Um, that application was withdrawn. And you'll see that the recommendation um, before you is not to deny one and approve the other. It's actually to approve the project with the condition that it matches the um, alternative to um, uh, for the lot configuration. And uh, so, so essentially you're, you would not be denying um, the project that's before you. You would be making a recommendation that the council approve 
um, the project with the condition that it conform with the second alternative that had subsequently been withdrawn. It's semantics, but I think it is important semantics that you were picking up on there, Chair Schifrin, and so um, that's why we, we worded that um, in the manner in which we did. But to clarify then, the application that be, is before the city at this point is alternative one. That's correct. The applicants have withdrawn the, um, the second alternative. Okay, so in reading the uh, housing, uh, 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 the language in the Housing Accountability Act that was in our staff report, um, the act applies to housing applications submitted to local agencies that meet that following criteria, meet the city's objective general plan and zoning standards, which the staff report says it does, the development would, uh, would not cause a significant adverse impact to public health or safety, which the staff report says uh, it won't, and the development meets the standards of the California Environmental Quality Act and the Coastal Act, uh, which the staff report says it does. Then the Housing Accountability Act says if an application meets these criteria, the city council or planning commission must vote to approve the application. So given that language, I don't see how um, it would be possible for the city to legally uh, approve something else. They've asked for essentially alternative one that meets the general plan and zoning standards. It doesn't cause a significant adverse impact to health and safety, and there are no CEQA or Coastal, Coastal Commission issues. On what basis could we approve something different and not approve where the language says we must approve the application. I don't see uh, the basis on which, or at least I like an explanation of the basis on which we could deny the application or approve something different than what they've applied for. Sure, it's a valid question, one that we've spoken with our legal team about as well. And because of the, the broad uh, implications of the uh, Housing Accountability Act, there is not anything in the Housing Accountability Act, as uh, Commissioner Spellman was pointing out before, there is nothing that says we cannot condition it on the uh, fact of uh, needing to provide additional housing. And uh, you know, with, with this particular project, um, given its um, proximity to public transit, to services, its, its walkability and bikeability, its you know, proximity to the west side jobs, the downtown, um, you know, we wouldn't necessarily on every project site um, feel that maximizing the density is as critical, but given that there's convenience markets right across the street, there's public transportation in literally every direction that you can uh, go from that center circle. There's a, a bus stop, and uh, given all those factors, the, uh, the staff felt that it is important to, um, to accomplish the general plan goals of maximizing density, and um, that would be done through an approval of this project with um, the recommended modifications to increase the number of units. Um, it would not be, and, and it is a semantics thing, but an important one, it would not be done through denial of this application and approval of the other. Okay, um, I guess I'll pursue this later. Um, thank you. Is, do any of the com other commissioners have questions of staff? Okay, then the next uh, part of the uh, hearing will be to hear from the applicant. Uh, my understanding from staff is that the applicant would like 15 minutes to make their presentation, standing that correctly. Okay, why don't we um, start the uh, applicant's presentation then? Uh, 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 will there be a slideshow with that? Okay. Which commissioner has a question? Uh, it's me, uh, Chair Schifrin, uh, Commissioner Dawson. Okay, Commissioner Dawson. Um, I did just want to make a comment um, about the pro a, a process uh, comment since we were discussing a little bit about the Housing Accountability Act and, and the process. I think uh, 
as a commission, I think we should really consider about, um, you know, one of the challenges around development is having a very um, transparent and predictable process. And so when an applicant comes forward um, with the significant investment of time and resources um, to put together something that meets all the requirements under both our um, planning guidance, our zoning, our general plan, as well as meeting the Housing Accountability Act, um, I, I think it's very important for us to consider um, that, the, that those proposals be taken on, on the face of their merits. And so um, I think it sets a precedent we should really uh, be uh, considerate of uh, for future that if an applicant comes with a development and then we're going to tell them that they need to do something completely different than, than, than what they are bringing forward. So I just want us to consider that and uh, consider ways that we can continue to make the process of approval um, as transparent and predictable as possible moving forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. But let me ask commissioners to hold their comments until after we have the public presentations. Um, so could we hear from the applicant now? Hello, this is Caitlin. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, yeah, great. So hi, everybody. Um, this is Caitlin Wild. I am one of the Circle of Friends members. Um, I can't quite see. Uh, there's a delay. Um, is our slideshow up? Yes. No, well, I don't know. I don't think so. Caitlin, if you could allow us. No problem. Okay, loud and clear. All right, so I'm going to start. Sarah, I think, so, sorry, Caitlin. Um, Sarah. I'm not seeing their slideshow. I'm seeing your um, phone call slide. One moment. We're going to reshare. Thank you for your patience. Clearly, we're struggling with technology here. Okay, here we go. This looks good. No now problem. No problem at all. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, like I said, my name's Caitlin. I'm one of the Circle of Friends members. And uh, about two and a half years ago, we purchased the Circle Church property with the intention of building a communal green co-housing space. Next slide, please. Um, so this is us. Um, this would normally be the part where we would all introduce ourselves, um, but technology is such that we can't. So um, Ginny and Joe here, both born and raised in Santa Cruz. Uh, Dwight moved from Marin County a couple of years ago and is quickly weaving himself into the community. Mark Thomas, uh, been here 40 plus years, raised with four kids here. He's a local teacher. Um, Alex is a retired businessman, splits his time between L.A. and Big Sur, and Brett, sitting six feet away from me right now, um, is a, has been here, what, 30-plus years, um, and I moved here 20 years ago, so local, working folks. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is a conceptual plan showing alternative one, formerly known as plan A, um, 12 single family residences and 12 ADUs. Um, we're maintaining a common green center just as it is now and the areas where our houses are on this drawing are mostly where parking lots are now and um, portions of the church as well. We're maintaining the open corridor down Woodrow, um, not to mention adding extra wide sidewalks and planting strips congruent with the sidewalks on Woodrow. Next slide, please. 
Um, so this slide shows uh, the zoning for the area. Uh, most of the lots on this map are 5,000 square foot lots. Um, some of them smaller lots closer to the circles. Uh, most of the west side is zoned R15, single family residences, 5,000 square foot lots. Um, there are no multifamily units on this map. The little purple um, spots are where Circle Market is and the other Circle Market on California. There's a little white dot, it's the Garfield Library, and the green is the Bethany Curve. Next slide, please. So um, co-housing, a lot of people have been curious about what a co-housing community is. Um, the way we see it, we buy together, build together, and live together. This is a project that would um, otherwise be impossible for us to make happen. So pooling our resources, investing together, planning together, building together, um, pouring our sweat equity into a grassroots bootstrapped project. Um, enables us as individuals to create homes on the west side that we wouldn't otherwise be able to afford. Um, and just a note on the COVID-19 pandemic that's happening right now has really reminded us of how important community is and how important it is to have friends and family close so we can share care and um, co-housing enables us to do that. Um, some of you might have noticed some real estate signs up at the circle. We are opening up our circle for folks to join as partners in the co-housing endeavor, and there has been a tremendous amount of interest, so we're happy about that. And then on the right here, there's a poster that we found at the National Housing Museum in Washington, D.C. that praises co-housing, um, our very own Coyote Crossing up on Western Drive, that demonstrates an exemplary use of land and community. Next slide, please. So our intention uh, is for our circle of homes to be an exemplary model for green building and community in Santa Cruz and beyond. We're planning on recycling the existing church as much as possible and meeting or exceeding green and lead standards for home building. Next slide. We will have congruent design threads. Um, each of us will be building our own unique home and our own unique taste. We'll be working together throughout the design process to ensure our homes and the site layout complement each other in the neighborhood and we will incorporate welcoming front porches, encouraging community interaction with our homes. And I, next slide, please. I'm going to pass the baton to my co-member, Brett, here. He's going to take over. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Brett Packer, and I'm one of the Circle of Friends. Um, we originally purchased this property two and a half years ago. Um, as a group with the intent of building our co-housing. And our first plan, which is now called Alternative One, with 12 houses and 12 ADUs, um, we worked up in conversation, we had multiple conversations with city staff prior to buying the property and after buying it um, to make sure that that was doable and fit the zoning, fit the R15 zoning. Um, and we got positive feedback on that. Um, and then a couple months into it, we had a meeting with the entire uh, planning staff and um, the planning director felt that we should um, increase the density um, and provide more diversity with our plan. Um, the original plan could be done under the zoning. Um, the plan was suggesting would be done under a PD. So um, somewhat reluctantly, we developed a secondary plan because we wanted the support of the planning staff as we went through this process um, and decided to submit two plans. Um, so we worked up uh, alternative two, which is 10 lots, and then uh, six condos, which are on two of the lots. Um, from the beginning,
thing. We've been committed to providing ADUs with the single family home on both plans. Um, in particular, if you look at alternative one with 12 single family homes and 12 ADUs, you know, that gets you up to 24 units and a lot of diversity with those ADUs. Um, and some of those would end up being rentals, which um, we need also. So we went forward with both plans through the application process and have been through all the departments been through two or three different city councils and some changes in the planning commission and um, many other bumps along the road. And um, we felt we could live with alternative two if it, if it was what the city council chose, although all along we've been fighting for alternative one because we're not developers. We are a group of friends that have gotten together um, to build houses for our families, and we don't have the resources, the organization, um, the skills, the financial wherewithal to build out those six condos. Um, that takes a big chunk of cash, several million dollars up front to build those out. We don't have the means to get that, and I'll, I'll get more into that a little in a little bit. Um, so we, we were, I'd say we were okay with going forward with both plans until um, COVID hit. And with the COVID crisis and the ensuing economic meltdown that's happening around us right now, and it looks like it's going to be with us for quite a while, our chances of getting financing to build the condo complex are pretty much nil. And same with the possibility of possibly selling that part of the development to a developer. Um, probably not likely in the next few years, which would, if this were approved, it would leave us stuck in a place that we couldn't move forward with the project um, until the market changes, which could be many years. So at that point, we decided to um, pull Plan A from our, or, oh, sorry, Plan B, Alternative two from our application and just proceed with alternative one. And alternative one um, is fully supported by the Housing Accountability Act, fully supported by SB 330, um, which we were just discussing. It's also much preferred by the neighbors. We had a series, well, we had a, a big public meeting in November, and then over the summer we had a series of open houses uh, where neighbors came by and we discussed our project with them. And the overwhelming feeling from the neighbors was that they did not want condos here at the circle and it didn't fit the neighborhood. Um, so hence, we officially pulled Plan A from the application that's coming up in this meeting. Um, we do not want to move forward with Plan 2, and we will not be in a position to move forward with Plan 2. We, um, it's financially unfeasible at this time and will probably be unfeasible for many years. Uh, we do appreciate the need for housing in Santa Cruz and the need for affordable housing, hence the ADUs that we are willing to commit to building. Um, and Plan A as single-family homes um, offers us bite-sized chunks that we can chew off and get those individual homes built rather than trying to build a six-unit condominium complex. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? So, um, and we can even go to the next slide. So here's a picture of those condos. Um, they are quite large, and the other houses in the neighborhood are much more modest. Um, our houses in general will probably lean towards the modest size, um, as most of us, that would be what we would need and can afford to build. Um, can we move on to the next slide? And then once again, there's the zoning, which is where this all started for us. Both of those lots you see there are 5,000 square foot lots. And... Um, We really 
would like you guys to consider how the COVID crisis is changing the world we're living in and how finances will be in the economy and the real estate market. And it, it will be almost impossible for us to move forward if alternative two is chosen. And it's no longer on the table, really. We've pulled it from the application. Um, alternative one follows the zoning, follows the law, meets the general plan, it fits the neighborhood, and the neighbors prefer it. Um, next slide, please. So once again, we got into this not to make money, um, to build houses for our families and friends at this site, um, to have a co create a co-housing community. Um, we believe and we know that we will um, care for the site and um, create a place that will bring a lot of community benefit um, through our living here, our families here. We're going to bring life to this circle that hasn't been here for many years. Um, it's been pretty lifeless for the last 20, 30 years. Um, I think that when people think of Santa Cruz and they that we'll be able to demonstrate the best that our community has to offer. And as it's, the Circle Church has historically acted as a place for people to gather and we're updating the building here and adding housing and then we'll be stewarding a welcoming gathering place that fosters social connectedness. In other words, there'll still be activities that can happen here, and we, I can actually speak to that now. Um, we will have an open center circle, it's about 10,000 square feet, that will contain gardens, uh, playing field, and hopefully eventually a shared common building. There'll be a common kitchen where we can have shared meals, uh, classes, art, um, do art, and um, one of the, the way that we're feeling like we can open that up to the community is that if community members want to use it or, or have something they'd like to do there, they can get one of the owners at the property, one of the partners of the co-housing group to sponsor them. And then uh, people from the outside community would be able to use the space with the sponsorship of one of us partners. Um, so, and we've been working with and talking to local dance groups, world dance, um, yoga groups, music groups um, that were involved in singing, et cetera. Um, and people are asking us about space. And so we're working on that as once we get further along towards, um, I'd say, making that space available to the public through sponsorship of the residents. Um, so what we need right now through this process is flexibility. This has been a very challenging um, journey for us over the last couple of years. It's very expensive, more money than we thought, uh, more time than we thought. We we're, certainly weren't planning on COVID crisis. And so the most flexibility, um, the more flexibility we have, the more likely that we are going to succeed. So we need to get, uh, get Alternative one approved, and we are requesting that you recommend approval of alternative one so that we can get moving on this and get some houses built and uh, get some life breathed back into this site. Um, that's all I have for now, and if you have questions at this time, we're happy to answer them. Um, and we really appreciate everybody um, doing this meeting tonight, dealing with the technology. Is this the, uh, is that the end of your pre uh, presentation? That's the end of our presentation. Are there any com questions from commissioners for the applicant? Yes, Commissioner Spellman. Yeah, one clarification on the ADUs. Are you planning to build 12 homes and 12 ADUs or just the possibility of the ADUs? Well, as you know, the ADUs are allowed. From the beginning of this project in our talks with the city, and just to the general public, we've been committing to the ADUs or saying that we're going to build them because we want to um, basically address the housing 
crisis, and we felt this was a strong way to do that. It's it's also you know it's good for our families, it's good for us. So when we say we're committed to that, we haven't codified that. We've talked to the city about that to staff, and it, it seems like it's a difficult thing to do. We are open to it if if, it, if need be. Um, so that's kind of where that's at right now. Thank you. Any other questions of the applicant? Yes, uh, Commissioner Greenberg. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thanks uh, for the presentation. Um, I was wondering about the question of, uh, you know, the final slide about community over profit and the desire to address the affordable housing crisis and um, this question of how any thoughts on how you might assure that affordability is a part of this project. Um, for instance, I know that some co-housing developments have limited equity co-ops kind of built into them. Is that any part of the thought around this one? How are you thinking about, you know, the potential for the housing that you're building to in the future once uh, houses are resold and so forth to remain affordable? So as um, either Lee or, Lee or Ryan said, we've been talking with um, well, I think it's Jessica, economic development, um, trying to sort this out. And there's um, a possibility right now, if we're able to get in lieu fees in early, that they can double them and put them into um, affordable housing projects they have going. Um, and that's our preference, and we think it's good for both the city and for us, and we'll get more housing built than if they're done on site. Um, the on-site potential is, um, as again, I think Brian mentioned, would be two units um, if it's uh, alternative two, which is no longer on the table. In alternative one with the lot subdivision, um, that would be done as an in lieu fee because it's, it's really not practical for someone with moderate income to uh, purchase a lot and then build a house. And another part of this is that um, a couple of our members are would qualify for moderate income housing. Um, so in, in a way, just doing this as a bootstrap sweat equity project, it's an affordable housing project. But I know that's hard to quantify and, and hard to take into the future, but that's why we're doing it and how we're doing it. I hope that's helpful. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so in the in the present moment, that would be true. Um, and um, yeah, I guess I'm interested in sort of thinking about how there might be partnerships possible. The question of who could partner in terms of the affordable units if the second option were to be you know, in order for the second option to be feasible, um, how there might be partnerships with uh, developers who are invested in uh, affordable housing um, and whether that's something that's been pursued, for instance, MidPen or other kinds of developers who might be able to uh, build affordable housing or, you know, partnerships that would enable um, city to step in in a more significant way or other other partners to help you because I understand the feasibility questions and whether that's something that's been pursued. Um, actually, I, I'm not familiar with that and we haven't pursued these options. Um, the ADUs will be affordable by design um, and we've been um, you know, so some of this is, is quite new to us. We have been talking to the Economic Development Department, department since we purchased the property two, two and a half years ago. Uh, there's been changes there as well, but recently we've been talking to Jessica and Bonnie. And um, we, we appreciate the need for affordability. And um, we did talk to Habitat at the very beginning of the project, and they were not 
interested um, the lots. There's too much. Well, part of the problem is the, the value on the west side here is, is high, and it's it's hard to make affordable housing work. There's other places where it's much more efficient um, as far as getting units on the ground. Is my understanding. Okay. Any other questions before we turn um, to someone else? Lee, did you want to? We're not able to hear you, Lee. Sorry. Thank you, Chair Schifrin. Um, I just wanted to uh, chime in. Uh, there was a question about the ADU requirement, and yes, the applicants have um, indicated that they want to um, build ADUs on either proposal. Um, I, I wanted to clarify, we did not include that, uh, that condition as a requirement. All we included was the condition that they show that it can be done. And, um, you know, certainly while we encourage and want that ADU production and that can bring a level of uh, design, uh, of affordability by design, um, however, you know, understanding the, uh, the way that this project is being developed, we didn't necessarily want to require those up front in case some of those um, individuals didn't have necessarily, didn't necessarily have the capital to do both the, the residents and the ADU up front. So, um, I just wanted to, to make sure, because there was a question about that, is it, what's required, and we haven't required it. Um, there does seem to be that commitment, and certainly there'd be a uh, economy of scale if they build it at the same time. But um, we did want to make sure that they're not precluding the, uh, you know, by the site design that they choose, they're not precluding the development of ADUs in the future. So we just said, um, when you come in for a design permit for the single family homes, that you show an ADU can be accommodated on the site, and the applicants were agreeable with uh, with that approach. Okay, thank you. Um, I understand that there's a Ms. Reeves who wanted to make a 10-minute presentation. Um, is that uh, Jessica Reeves? Sounds yeah, like that's we're me. ready to have your presentation. Hi, yeah, okay, can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. I can okay, hear you. great. Um, do you have the, the first slide up? Bear with us just a minute. We're getting there. Oh, no worries. Yeah, no worries. I, it's hard because I can't see the slides, so I'm just like. <laughs> so just, uh, we'll let you know when it comes. Okay, cool. So as I understand it, no one can see the screen, the Zoom screen except us, or can the public, that, that's available? Okay, so, okay, you, in the heart of the circles is the first slide, then you're ready to go. Yep. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone, for putting in a great effort uh, to be here tonight, given all the the crazy circumstance. So, so yeah, I'll introduce myself. I'm Jess Reeves. Um, I'm a resident of the Circles neighborhood. I live on Walk Circle, a small 2,200 square foot lot. <laughs> um, and I'm here representing Save the Circles, Save the Heart of the Circles. Um, and I just want to get started today by showing you, so, sorry, next slide. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so our goal um, as a group of concerned neighbors is we would really like to buy the property at 111 Eret Circle and preserve it as a community space. And, you know, we've been trying to get um, fundraising up and going, and there's lots of information on our website. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you more specifically about today is if developed, um, we really want this property to provide some sufficient public benefit. Um, next slide, please. Um, and by sufficient public benefit, we're just going to be real upfront with, with the things we're looking for here, is we want to see a prominent structure in the, in the plans that are, that are finally um, okayed by the commission. We'd ask the commission wait for a historic district designation before the demolition of the church, um, and I'll get more into that later. But we'd also ask that the planning commission incorporate some mixed uses into the plan. Um, we've also, we'll also put forth some ideas towards a community hall, a gathering space, and just also asking for the Planning Commission to consider possibly smaller lots, some affordable units, which would allow for more green space that could be shared by the community. 
So today I'm speaking for um, a number of people. We have 117 people on our mailing list, 280 people petition, like paper petition signatures, and 2,200 people have signed our um, petition online. So this is a really large group of people um, that I'm speaking for today, and a lot of them come from the neighborhood. So some points of order we wanted to get to first is in the staff report, um, it was it's constantly being said by the owners, and now we see it in the staff report, which really kind of hurt close to home, was that the church ceased use several years ago, which is just not true. Um, the Gospel Community Church has over 200 congregants, and they've been they're happily been at this location for two years of service, um, and they're thriving. They're they're a big part of our community. So another thing we wanted to talk about is um, we went through all the documentation that was put up online, and we read the letter from Arnett Fox LLP, and it's constantly coming up that the clients are not developers, um, and we see the, the sort of information coming up again and again in, in social media and different forms. And now that we have this public forum, forum we just really want to say, like, there are six locals that are um, part of the circle of friends. Um, but Mark Thomas is one of those locals. He's the current listing agent, and he's a property developer. Um, and Brett Packard, who we gratefully heard from earlier today, he owns a construction and development company as well. Um, and the main developer is one Alex Akakian, um, who is a real estate developer from Los Angeles. Um, and he owns properties up and down the coast of California. And just to put it out there for the commission, we'd really like to say maybe he could possibly provide some capital to help develop the higher density uses um, in alternative two. Um, next slide. Oh, I keep forgetting to say next slide. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so right now I'm on conditions of acceptance. Is that okay if we go up to there? Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay, cool. Okay, so sorry. I'm so sorry about that. It's like I'm not used to it. Okay, so condition 37, um, we, we're really going to ask the Planning Commission to uphold that if um, alternative two is recommended. Um, and we also ask that in terms of condition 35, we actually want affordable housing in our neighborhood. It may be more economically beneficial for the affordable housing to go elsewhere, but we really feel like it's, a, it's an important part of the socioeconomic fabric of the circle's neighborhood. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so I just want to speak a little bit towards the demolition plan. Um, the owners are... are often saying that this is a dead amount of property, um, but there's a lot of people that are stakeholders here. Um, the church is up and running. It's been running for two years now. There's a social hall and gymnasium. Um, there's classrooms. There's an autism center. There's a chiropractor. And all these people, including the neighborhood around, are stakeholders. And we really would ask that the commission consider how the demolition would affect um, all these different stakeholders. Next slide, please. Um, and so we really ask is, could the church be something else? Um, this secularization is happening all over the country, and different really awesome communities are making decisions to preserve these church places and make them into mixed-use places. Um, so the Brooklyn Collective, you can see there's an event space. Um, they have offices there. They have a coffee shop. In South Carolina, the church there, there's a church there, it's the one that's called Make It Charlotte. Um, that is a maker's market that's open once a month, and people come in, and there's a coffee shop, and it's really bringing the community together. And on the right, I just have some wonderful images of beautiful churches that have done a great job at sort of modernizing themselves into to our more secular society. Next slide, please. And so we just want to first ask for this prominent structure. You can see it if you look up West Cliff, um, and it was brought up during the Historic Planning Committee, um, this idea of the view shed, incorporating a focal point up the ocean from Woodrow. And we really don't see that in um, either Alternative 1 or Alternative 2. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, and then I wanted to also speak towards this prominent structure and how it could play into our historic district. So we met with um, Christina, who was one of the DPR historians, and she said actually the, historic, the Circles neighborhood already qualifies as a historic district. And if you look at the map on the left, these are all the locations that make our district historic. And so although we're still going through um, the process of getting the designation, if you look at page 25 on the environmental checklist, it says in the report that the project site is not located within a designated historic district. That's true, but it might not be for long. And so we really ask that the commission take that into consideration when giving the green light to this demolition. Um, next slide, please. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about serving community. And, you know, the church's owners have served the community um, in many of ways. There's all these mixed uses on the property that are still happening today. There's this large area of green space that everyone's been able to use. And we really don't see any sort of large amount of service to the community. You know, there's a small courtyard in the middle, and it's private property. It's not zoned as public. There's no way for us to see that the public could use it. Um, so just next slide. Um, we were thinking of maybe there could be this idea of the communal house. As we read more about the co-housing literature, our group, we found that there was these great communal houses. And this is an example. This is, this is of a uh, co-housing community. But this is the community house. It's um, the first life saving club at Freshwater Beach in Australia. Um, the top level on the right you can see is this beautiful um, um, banquet hall. On the bottom they have a cafe. Possibly if it was similar, something similar in the circle's location, there could be a gymnasium on the bottom that could incorporate the mixed uses that we've seen. Um, and so next slide. So this is just another sketch up of the way the property could potentially look. Um, all the, if it's truly this co-housing communal community, all the parking could go towards the back of the property. Um, the front could have a communal house with a gymnasium, a cafe, lots of things that could service the community, have um, a beautiful maybe lighthouse type structure on the top that would have a prominent view down um, Woodrow. And then all the other houses would be surrounded by, you know, beautiful yards going around and it would be great. Um, but it would definitely much better serve the community in this way. Um, next slide, please. So here, here I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, co-housing development in Davis. And you can see that the proportion in this one, that the houses are much higher density, and it's really a focus on having more shared space. And they, they actually have a communal house. You can see it in the back there. Um, and we really don't see that in the plans that are put forward um, by the owners. It's really one-seventh of the space is designated as communal. Um, and that just doesn't really fit in with the whole co-housing jive. And if you look on the right-hand side, we can see towards the center of the circles, the lots in the circles are actually a lot smaller. Like I live on a 2,200 square foot lot, and I'm really happy here, and it's part of the nature of our neighborhood. Um, and so next slide. So what if we could retain the view shed, get more communal space that could possibly be open to the public as a community? Um, if we have this festival lawn looking down Woodrow, it would really um, preserve that, that view shed down Woodrow. Um, and then, you know, some of the lots could be larger. Six lots for the local families could be larger. Some of the lots could be smaller, um, providing affordable housing that people could actually buy on the west side. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of where we're at. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So once again, we're just going to hit su sufficient public benefit for us means a prominent structure, waiting for historic designation, mixed uses, possibly having a community hall or gathering space, and then incorporating some smaller slots with affordable units that are actually on the west side of Santa Cruz would be really great. Um, next slide. We just have, I just have a couple final remarks. Um, from the city council meeting on February 25th, um, Mayor Justin Cummings said he wants to see places for community members to gather and spaces for different types of community events and classes on this plan. And we just don't see that right now. And so we'd really like the planning commission to ask the owners, developers, locals to go back to the drawing board and really take our suggestions and comments to heart this time. 
Um, we'd also ask the developers to consider sale to our group. We've got to pitch it there. And we've contacted the current listing agent, and, and he refuses to sell to us. And so next slide, and that's us. Save the heart of the circle. Thank you so much, everybody, for your time today. Thank you very much, Ms. Reeves. Uh, do any commissioners have questions? Uh, we don't usually do this with every. Yeah, year. that's okay. There's, um, since we have two these two presentations, I want to give the commissioners a chance to ask questions if they have any. Okay, seeing no no one, um, I'm going to now open it up to the public um, in general. I want to ask the clerk how many uh, people have indicated their desire to speak on this item. They're rolling in. There are 22 attendees, two of which are the two parties that just gave presentations. Just give it a moment. That'll give everybody an opportunity. All the other 20 folks that may want to uh, raise their hands. But right now it looks like there's about 10. Two or three minutes to wait. Chair would be great to allow the video to catch as well as people that dial in all those phone numbers. Okay, it's now 8.45. Um, we'll, I'll wait till 8.48. But I'd appreciate it if you stop sharing the screen so it's possible to do something else. Thank you. Since we want to let people call in, if they haven't called in, maybe you need to uh, share the screen again. I was just wanting to look at something else, and I couldn't do, with the shared screen. But why don't you do that? Couple minutes, and then we'll. Okay, great. Reminder to the public watching on Comcast Channel 25 or through community television to call in now for public comment on 111 Eret Circle. We're doing this pause for individuals who are not already on the line to join us on the phone line. And this is a reminder to the public. One 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 Eric Circle. Already on the phone line, please dial in now.
Okay, thank you. Chair Schifrin, there are 12 members of the public that have raised their hand at this time to uh, speak. Okay, assuming that that's going to be the full number of people who are speaking, um, I ask each person to keep it brief, but you'll have up to three minutes to make a presentation. As I mentioned before, the, uh, the clerk will notify you when you have 30 seconds left. Um, so let's get started. Thank you. Oh, hi, this is Sue Powell. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, uh, hi, um, Commissioner um, Schifrin. Um, my name is Sue Powell, and I have lived um, on Wilkes Circle for 36 years, so I am a neighbor of um, the Circle Church. I've been here for quite a while, and uh, I've been working with residents of the Circle's neighborhood since November of 2018 to ask the city and the owners of the 111 Eret Circle property to listen to our concerns and to integrate these concerns into the proposed development plans. Our concerns have great value and importance to the future of our community. We are advocating for the integrity of the Circle's neighborhood. Planners and urban designers from all over the world agree with our perspectives and goals. An example is discussed in an article titled The Five C's of Neighborhood Planning by Howard Blackson. He discusses the most essential components that create health and vitality in a community. He states that vibrant, flourishing neighborhoods are complete, compact, connected, complex, and convivial. He also provides an illustration of a model neighborhood that has a center with a public space. These components and the ideal model are exactly what presently exists in the Circle's neighborhood with the Circle Church at our center. The Circle Church has provided a commons, an open space, and a place for our spiritual and community gatherings for 130 years. I submitted petitions with 2,340 signatures by email to the Planning Commission yesterday. Um, we are asking the Planning Commission to recognize the important public benefit that the Circle Church has provided for a great length of Santa Cruz history and to work with the developers to integrate the needs and concerns of the community. Our preferred option is to pre uh, preserve the Circle Church. We do not want to lose public access and opportunities for community gatherings at this beautiful and iconic site like no other on the west coast of the United States. But if the Planning Commission must move ahead with approval for subdivision and development, then please recommend a project that fits the scale and the affordability of the Circle's neighborhood. Small houses, small lots and it provides for community benefit with public space and mixed use opportunities. Affordability is especially important right now with the worldwide economic downturn as a result of the pandemic. At the city council meeting on February 25th, Mayor Justin Cummings agreed that Santa Cruz needs more space for community gatherings and stated about the Arid Circle project, and I'm quoting, I am hoping that as this continues down the path, that the developers continue working with the community members, continue working with the city council, so that we can try to have as much community benefit that comes out of this project as it moves forward. So thank you for considering um, our input. Thank you very much. Ms. Powell? Yes. Next. Um, is that me? Yes, it sounds like it is. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I've been a 29-year resident of Santa Cruz County, and I lived in um, Santa Cruz for 17 years. I lived in Felton now for 12 years. Um, but, you know, what I think is really appalling to me is the neighbors that are opposing this project are not willing to accept this is private property now. It was not bought as a community space. It is not a community space. It's not a park. It is private property. And the fact that the owners are willing to accommodate the neighbors and open up the space to some classes or some use is really generous of them because it impacts on their 
um, right to peace and quiet, to privacy, even having an open place in their backyard, which I don't really understand why that is seems like it's being requested or something, is really an invasion of their privacy. And as far as density goes, I consider the ADUs, even though it's not officially considered density units, that's dense enough to put 12 other units behind these houses. Um, affordability, as far as that goes, you know, this is not a big construction company like Swenson or Granite that can afford to build 100 units of affordability or even the condos. And, you know, it seems like these community members are expecting the, these owners to finance their wants. And they're trying to build their own homes. So to me, it's really inconsiderate of these other neighbors, the circle, save the circle people, that they're putting all these demands on this property. It's been sold. It was not sold as community space. It will not be community space. It's private homes for locals who can't afford to buy some of these 500, 1,000, uh, a million dollar homes that are on the market. Um, and, you know, as far as the plan, plan one, also known as plan A, which is what the owners want, it's what the neighbors in favor of this project want, and it meets the zoning, there shouldn't be any question. And trying to put these conditions on it that, you know, um, to make them have these additional density is essentially trying to coerce them into having plan B, which I don't think is fair of the city members. You know, it's not their property. They're not building their homes. They're not developing this property. So, you know, this manipulation needs to stop. Okay, the property's been sold. Show some respect for the owners and the plan that they have. It is meeting all the criteria. Please vote for plan A slash plan one. Design A. Would you like to give us your name, please? Patricia Combs. Thank you very much. Belton resident. Thank you. Bye. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, give us your name if you would. Thank you, this is Ross Gibson. I'm a resident of the West Side, one of the residents who was invited to the 2018 outreach meeting. But I was disappointed that it was nothing but a take it or leave it meeting. The developers have been particularly deaf to calls from the community, from planners, from historic preservation and the city council, hoping to mitigate the loss of something originally designed to be the centerpiece of the circles and everyone's public commons. The current building was custom made for this lot with sensitivity to its place in the neighborhood. The festival lawn is spacious. It is the width of the broad Woodrow Avenue view shed providing a vista to the central tower over the broad park space that is iconic to the neighborhood's character. The real estate ad described the church campus as the heart of West Side Santa Cruz, but the developers misunderstood how central it was to the neighborhood's activities. Co-housing is a shared community, and privatizing a neighborhood's shared spaces misses the co-housing ethic entirely. Evicting stakeholders without mitigating the loss of community resources puts the development in opposition to the neighborhood as opposed to partnering with how the neighborhood functions. Proposed, this proposed pizza pie subdivision is just unsuitable to the site and the neighborhood. Yet this is the exact same plan they designed in 2017, resisting any accommodations requested from the public or city government. It has insufficient community benefit. The developers need to go back to the drawing board to create a courtyard subdivision that includes a central open space and tower-like vista features and includes more elements of the current uh, facility, such as gym, church, and community center. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Ginny Stone, and I'm one of the Circle of Friends members. I was born in Santa Cruz, and I've lived here my whole entire life. Um, I currently reside on the west side in a 600-square-foot rental, um, and I am very excited to move 
a half a mile away over to 111 Era Circle. We are a really diverse group. We are not wealthy. Some of us live in trailers. Um, some of us qualify for low income. Uh, we definitely aren't developers from out of town. Um, we, we, um, we seek a creative solution to a price tag that has driven many longtime residents out of town. And we have worked very, very hard within the existing framework put forth by the county, by the city, sorry, to accomplish that goal. It was definitely, we were a little naive going into this, and it was definitely more than, more work than we expected, but we have maintained. Um, one, one of the things that we were able to do was rent some space within our church in order to offset some of the um, property tax costs while we're waiting for this to go through approval, but I want to express to the Planning Commission that our tenancy is about one-fourth. We cannot keep it rented, and that is even at cut-rate prices. And currently, we have had our tenants leave in droves with the COVID situation, so there's not really a whole lot happening at the church right now um, as far as any kind of use. Um, what can we do? Um, so Lee was telling you guys that he did not want to codify or commit us to do ADUs because he was worried about our ability to pay for those. I would like to express that it would be much more difficult for us to pay for condos than it would for ADUs, and we have said from the very, very beginning over and over that we would be willing to commit to those ADUs if there was some way of doing that. We all plan on building ADUs, and even junior ADUs. This is going to be an extremely diverse um, network of houses um, of varying sizes, and they're, um, so just if anybody wants to pursue that further, that is something that we are extremely open to. Um, so again, I just want to drive home that we're not developers, we're locals, we're, some of us are realtors, some of us are builders, and, um, but realtors and builders should be allowed to build their houses too um, for their families to live in. And Finally, I just want to say um, I really look forward to what we believe in is the best use, the highest use for this site, and that is housing in Santa Cruz. Thank you very much, Commissioners. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello. Um, my name is Justin. Um, I'm a resident of uh, the Circles neighborhood. Um, so I actually don't have any personal connection to the church, and I um, I'm probably like comparatively a new neighbor, but I'd like to offer some negative comments on the proposal. Um, just during my short stay um, here, I can totally feel the sense of uh, resentment within the entire neighborhood. I feel this is probably going to be a huge battleground for the neighborhood for the years to come. Um, and I, uh, I feel the whole thing doesn't really ha have enough uh, transparency and doesn't the entire process just doesn't attempt to incorporate the community feedback. Um, and I understand this is a private property, but what we're talking about here is the dramatic change in the usage of land and, and the division of one existing lot into 12 lots. Um, and given that this is such a historical site and potentially can become a historical district designation, I. Um, like I would say, I really recommend, recommend the com, um, committee to wait to approve this. Um, and particularly also given the current um, COVID situation, um, like we're having those uh, virtual meetings um, and a lot of community is not really being engaged. And I'm not sure how the construction will really work out for the so -called, uh, circle of friends, or even if they go with their preferred plan, will the community, uh, community be eventually disappointed at the uh, result or will the constru construction really work out for them, this is all very uncertain. So I think we should probably pause the decision and try to incorporate more community feedback um, into this whole conversation. So that's my take. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Hi. This is uh, Carolyn Ronzano, and I've lived in uh, Santa Cruz for over 40 years. I've lived on the west side in the circles for 21 years. It's where I've raised my daughter. 
And um, the center has been a part of our neighborhood. It's a spiritual center, a community center, a park for over 130 years. It's always served people. And it's integral to the quality of life to this working class neighborhood. And the original design for these smaller lots was for affordable housing for working class folks. And this was the first affordable housing. But what's so critical to that design and why it works is this large grass area, this open space in the center. Many of these people don't have yards. Jess was telling you she has a 2,200 square foot lot. And I know she has a three-year-old daughter, and it's a daily ritual for her and her daughter and her dog to walk over. It's in space. It's really key to the current design, and to lose it is a deficit to public benefit. And I don't see any public benefit with this proposal. There's absolutely nothing to do with affordable housing. Um, the lo they bought their, their shares were selling two years uh, two years ago for three hundred and thirty thousand dollars. They are now selling for $460,000. So there, it's going up. I did go to one of their um, summer meetings, and I asked the same question the commissioner asked. If you say it's affordable housing. What does that mean when you resell? Will you resell it at an affordable price? And I was told by Jimmy Stone, these will be million-dollar homes. And I'm also very concerned about the snowfoot thing. You know, there's going to be a lot more dire needs for that money, and if it's not been obligated, don't count on it. I work, I've had money reappropriated on federal projects that are 75% complete. I think that they need to be held to the 15% affordable housing. You know, and I also like the idea of exploring partnering with um, developers that could assist them in affordable housing. We don't want to lose the church. We do want to preserve it for the neighborhood. And, but if we do have to lose it, we want to make it count. We should address affordable housing, and this area with working class people is the place where affordable housing is needed most, especially, especially with the gentrification that's happened in the last 10, 20 years. So I really hope that, and the other thing too I'm really concerned about, thank you, is I'd like to ask that they can prove that they can actually get the funds to build this before they get issued a demolition um, permit. So, then thank you for your time, um, and please support with best for the whole community, not just 10 people. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Hello. My name is Freya Sands. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Um, my, my name is Freya Sands. I live on Wilkes Circle. And my message is fairly simple. This is a matter that should not be rushed through. The neighborhood will lose a treasure if the church is demolished and developed. If the church is demolished and the property goes for development, a community that will lose some of the benefit of the past and all of the future of the benefit of the will be gone forever. So please take this into account as you make your decisions. Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Chair Schifrin and Planning Commissioners. Um, my name is Alexia Garcia. I work with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership Housing Initiative, and I would like to express our support for the proposed project our housing initiative was founded in 2015 to support an increase in housing production across all types and income levels in our region. <clears throat> Excuse me. We support increasing density in locations near existing jobs and services in order to minimize urban sprawl and increase sustainability. And Eric Circle is aligned with our housing initiative goals. And um, for that reason, we've endorsed this project. In addition to our own support, numerous community members have submitted their own letters of support for Eric Circle through our online action center. And overall, we think this is a really thoughtful proposal and both um, alternative one and alternative two would yield highly needed housing for the Santa Cruz community. But we do align with the city, uh, with city staff's recommendation to approve alternative two in order to maximize density and carry out the general plans land use goals. Um, ultimately with everything going on, I think 
we think more than ever we need to promote the health of our community by supporting housing opportunities like these. So we ask that you'll consider joining our diverse coalition of stakeholders in supporting this important project and recommend the approval of the Air Circle housing development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, please. Thank you. I think that's me. We can hear you. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Ken White. I uh, uh, live in the Circles uh, neighborhood. Uh, and uh, I want to say I, I have no particular attachment to the existing uh, building or any association with, uh, with you know, any of the groups involved in this. Um, but I do live here. I do experience this. I've looked at this space for a long time. Uh, and I have to say that although I don't have an attachment to the building, the location is literally central to the entire design of the neighborhood. I do support housing. And I support the continued uh, use of you know, a range of multiple uses, which have been there and, and more that you know, could and should be there. And I don't see any reason why we can't have both at this location. This is, you know, has historically been a single lot. It seems like it is you know, an optional thing of the, the community to decide whether or not to subdivide it. But uh, keeping publicly accessible commercial use potentially on the ground level or something along those lines, with housing above would seem to meet both goals uh, and be far better in support of a real mixed use. I'll note that the, uh, uh, the uh, despite living you know, in the circles, I never received any outreach by mail, by flyer, or elsewhere. So I came to this late when I found that this had advanced it as far as it was. Um, and I'll also say that, that co-housing is absolutely great. I, I've supported co-housing. I've helped create co-housing for, for over decades. But taking away community use is terrible and is contrary to the spirit. So I, I strongly request that uh, the design be modified to achieve a win-win solution for everyone with housing and with continued mixed public access and use in this location. Thank you very much. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, sorry. Okay, hi, um, my name is Barbara Allen Young. I'm here with my husband, Jim Allen Young, and uh, we've been residents of um, the Circles for 28 years. Uh, we're, we're actually in support of this project. Um, just to briefly address what the last speaker said, this is an R1 neighborhood, you know, so uh, having businesses on the bottom, housing above, you're talking about two or three or more story buildings in the heart of a neighborhood that is all, for the most part, single story um, homes. And um, gosh, there's a lot of things, you know, I, I just want to address, I have friends that live on the Upper West Side co-housing. At no time has the common space there um, you can walk through it. It's never been closed. You can walk through it. You could go see friends that live there, but it's never been thought of as like a park-like um, aspect that you could just come with your dogs and let them run free and, and have it be a park-like aspect. You know, it's there, but that's not what the common space is actually used for. And um, another uh, point that I wanted to make is that there are two parks in our neighborhood, two active parks. There's Garfield Park and then there's Natural Bridges. Those are huge open spaces with, well, not so much Garfield Park, but uh, Natural Bridges Park and Garfield Park are two parks that are in our neighborhood. There's West Cliff, there's the beaches that are all within walking distance of, of the church. So it's not as if the church is the only space in our neighborhood. I. I was on the um, Save the Circle website. I appreciate their passion for saving the church. I, however, have lived right across the street from the church for 28 years. I have been here through good times and bad. There was a solid year that I looked at a porta potty that was placed there by a previous pastor. 
trying to do good, you know, but it was, it was definitely the first thing I saw in the morning and the last thing I saw at night was a porta potty. And these folks that are trying to build, you know, co-housing are a thoughtful group of folks. Um, they are trying to build fairly dense housing in our neighborhood. Um, I often think what it would, I would like to actually, you know, have input from folks who live around Loudon Nelson. How does it feel to have a community spot that's used quite a bit, including myself when my children were small, you know, day in, day out, theater, group. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Hi, uh, this is Matt Huerta, uh, Housing Program Manager with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. Um, you heard earlier from my colleague that we've officially endorsed this development after thorough evaluation. I wanted to hit on at least two or three items that had come up in um, commission discussion and, and earlier on here in the, in the public uh, hearing. Um, one is around feasibility and, you know, in working directly with a uh, circle of, of friends, um, they absolutely have move forward and as thoughtful and as uh, cooperatively as they as they can given all the circumstances and challenges that they've outlined we're certainly sensitive to the issue of feasibility and as they go forward if they can demonstrate that um, that alternative two is, is not feasible then certainly uh, that bears uh, consideration by the city um, secondly around the 24 homes that we see uh, certainly that the 12 lots um, we're very interested in making sure if uh, if there's ways that to, that the city can codify or condition or potentially even ask the developer to voluntarily agree through some kind of recorded memoranda something uh, some mechanism that there's a guarantee for the community that that those uh, additional units uh, ADUs will actually be be built I think that that's uh, uh, very important to us as well and then finally, if there is a way for the developer to pay the in-lieu fees um, under either circum either alternative, pay those alternative uh, pay those in-lieu fees early, in order to match the uh, funds, as was mentioned earlier by the housing staff, um, that would also generate more affordable housing for the community uh, through deeply targeted affordable housing offsite. Um, so I think there's absolutely a way to get uh, a lot of additional um, win for the, the whole community here, and we're excited to support uh, the efforts there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Go Hi. Ahead. My name is Robin Stone, and I've been a resident of Santa Cruz County since 1972. I raised my children in this community and have worked as a public health nurse for the County of Santa Cruz since 1989. I am I'm here to support the co-housing project at 111 Eric Circle. My daughter is one of the members and I have had the good fortune over the past two plus years of getting to know the partners and to witness the group working diligently, cooperatively with grassroots integrity to try and bring this project to fruition. These are local people who want to create affordable homes for their families in a community setting. The Circle of Friends plan is consistent with the city's zoning plan and requires no variances. The plan will provide 12 single family homes with 12 ADUs, which will provide much needed housing. I know that my daughter is very concerned about how, how I will manage as I age, and her vision is to provide her ADU for me. These are the kind of people that are part of the circle group. The circle home fits in with the existing neighborhood, single family homes with ADUs. We've spoken to resident neighbors who have expressed great concern about higher density housing. The neighbors do not want condos in the neighborhood, that there would be additional traffic and it would be an eyesore. Additionally, the circle members are not developers. They are local people who have local jobs. They are already financially strapped after two plus years of jumping through hoops 
and now contending with the financial devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic. Additional requirements, such as higher density housing and additional hoops to jump through, would create much um, would create more hardship and strain for these families. Please do the right thing by allowing the Circle Plan to move forward once and for all. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Does the clerk know how many more speakers we have? I've lost count. We have one. Okay. Hi there. Uh, my name is uh, Rafa Samuel. Uh, I've lived in uh, Santa Cruz since 1989. Cool. I uh, grew up on the west side, uh, went to Bayview Elementary School, and I've spent uh, a lot of time in the circles. Um, so I definitely appreciate everything that the circles has been. Um, I also know how important it is for Santa Cruz to have more affordable housing. And I have to say I was actually disappointed that, that, that this project uh, and this plan didn't have uh, as much density as, as it could have had. Um, if if uh, we developed this project with um, the maximum number of affordable units and the maximum number of ABUs, we could have something like 44 project, uh, uh, units on the site. And uh, neither of these, uh, 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 Plan A or Plan B, uh, gets quite close to 44 units. Um, so given the situation where we are now with uh, choosing a, a, a lower density or a higher density, and uh, I, I think we need to move forward with Plan B. Um, uh, there are opportunities for uh, uh, for the for the multifamily housing on the on that in that plan to be developed uh, if uh, if the circle of friends can't come up with the capital I'm sure there are other private developers who would be willing to uh, to buy that section of the property and maybe even redevelop it into a higher density. Uh, space, uh, or they could squeeze in uh, another couple of units or something like that. Uh, I, I work with a, a community land trust, and if we were able to arrange the uh, uh, funding to acquire the land, we would be interested probably in, in stewarding the land. Uh, perhaps the city itself would be interested in buying the land for the multifamily housing in order to, to make it work. Um, I also agree with Matt Huerta. I think it's important for uh, the uh, the 10 or 12 uh, single family uh, lots to have codified uh, ADE requirements. So I think we should go with plan B and we should uh, codify the ADE requirements for the other lots. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you. Shepherd? Yes. Um, since identifying that that was the remaining speaker, four other folks have raised their hands. Um, so you may want to let anyone on the line know they need to press star nine now if they want to join in. It looks like other we probably people? have about 10 other people that have not indicated that they want to speak aside from the four that just raised their hand. Okay. Um, it's now. Now we have seven. Okay. It's almost 9.30. Um, I'm going to limit the testimony of the next speakers to two minutes each. Um, and we have how many? Seven more people or nine? Yeah, there's seven more that have indicated that they want to speak, and it looks like there are um, five that have made no indication. So. Okay. So those seven will have two minutes, and then if any of the five want to speak, they'll have one minute. So let's start with uh, first uh, the, the first next speaker. Okay. Hello. Hi. Go ahead. You're on. Hi. My name is Mark Thomas. I'm one of the Circle of Friends, and I was identified earlier as the realtor who helped purchase the property and is now selling shares in the property. So I want to clarify a couple of things. Um, number one, um, there's a question about uh, from the um, NIMBYs of um, the status of the developers or not. Um, 
they're suggesting that I'm a developer. I have developed one project. It was a church. We uh, refurbished it. It's over next to the buttery on the uh, Seabright area of Santa Cruz, and that's it. Um, I'm not a regular developer. I'm a school teacher and been a school teacher for 30 years. Uh, I became a realtor when I figured that I better be able to make some more money to be able to send my kids to college. Um, Brett Packer is not a developer. He's a contractor, and he does fine remodeling. And then Alex Hakakian is a furniture store owner. He owns two homes, one in Southern California and one in Big Sur, and so he's not a developer yet. There is um, concern about how many people use the church and what a community asset it was. The average number of people using the church per hour is four. Um, there's a lot of time where the church is not used at all, particularly during the, the day and the night. Um, in general, the Circle Church had a lot of problems over the previous 30 years, and Pastor Barry Wilbanks said it best when he asked the neighbors, where were you the past 30 years? What, what, the church was slowly dying. It was dying from lack of support, and you weren't there to save it. So the church failed. What the church failed twice. The church failed twice, and that's why they sold it, because they didn't have enough parishioners. So we bought it with the intention of building homes, and the 12 um, pizza slice was actually identified in the uh, prospectus for the sale of the property by their land use consultant. That was the church itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Okay. Hello. Hello, go ahead. Hi, my name is Hillary Marticius and I live on uh, Walk Circle many, many years, almost 30 now. And I just want to say that I don't think this is an issue of affordable housing at all. Because I don't think anything that's going to be built there is going to be affordable in even two years. It's all going to be million-dollar investments. And that's what I think of affordable housing. I don't think that's what this is. What I'd like to talk about is something a lot deeper than development. I want to talk about the purpose of that circular piece of property. Go back 135 years, and you'll find out why it's in a circle. It is because people of a spiritual nature... Not very popular among anybody who's been talking here, but there is a Christian, Christian, Jesus Christ, yes, was the raising up of this area. You see, the people who came there and made it a circle were Christians. So this is the heart of why it looks the way it does. That's why there are circles around it. It was because people cared about Christianity. And I will say, yes, it hasn't been esteemed like it should be, but that's our fault. But I don't think we should tear down something and put up so-called affordable housing, because it's not going to be affordable at all. But we will always regret when we tear down something that was meant for a purpose. It has a purpose. Don't let it go. It's too important. Please, please don't let it go. And that's what I have to say. Please reconsider. Reconsider. Affordable housing. There are hills and there are miles and miles of property that we can do affordable housing. But you can't change the nature of the Circles neighborhood. You'll never get it back. The heart of it is a Christian place. I know we don't call ourselves Christians anymore, but there's a spirituality here. And, it, and if it's erased, we'll never remember it as what it was, what it was purposed for. I know we'll be a lot happier if we'll leave it this way. We can afford housing. Is the clerk giving people 30-second warnings? I did give her 30-second warnings, uh, Chair. I just don't think I you can probably hear it. <laughs> okay. Please do. Okay, next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Steve Claybush. Can you hear me? Yes. Go, go ahead. I've, I've lived on the circles for 30 years. I'm a property owner on the circles for 30 years, and I kind of take offense to the, the uh, comment that it's lifeless in the past 20 or 30 years. I don't think any of the people that are involved in this have lived on the circles for any length of time, so they don't really know what has happened or is happening on the circles. And um, if you go to their website, the Circle of Friend, Friends website, um, four of the people are listed as developers. 
whether they want to admit to that or not, they put it right out there in front of the public that they are developers. Three of those own over half the shares. And so if this is a shared community, um, they're not sharing very much. So to me, that looks like a development project, a land speculation project. And if you do the simple math, um, the original sales price was $3.3 million. Divide that by 12. That's $275,000 per lot. They are now selling the lots for $460,000. So they are not part of the solution to affordable housing. They are the problem. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, uh, my name is White Bandak. I'm also one of the uh, members of the community. Uh, and I'll just be quick to this. Uh, regarding developers, um, uh, the bottom line is nobody here is, is building anything to sell it for a profit, um, including Alex, who, who, uh, pl who is wealthy. And the reason he owns three lots is that he could afford to, and we wouldn't have been able to do this without it. His plan is to build three homes for his kids. Um, I own two shares, and one of mine was going to be for my niece or my brother. Um, so I'm, uh, it, it's sad that we are being – three of three of our members have never owned homes, and it seems like the entire group that is, that is levering these assaults on us are all homeowners <laughs> in the neighborhood. Secondly, um, I, I just wish that, that uh, the use of the property argument, which I respect their passion, but – the general plan uh, was something that was undertaken for a couple of years, and there was community input, as all cities have. And so I, I understand the frustration, but directing it towards us is just not fair. Um, lastly, um, as far as the cost, um, we, um, I'm selling my second share because I can't afford to help my brother or my niece get it. One of our members is getting a partner in a share. We're, we're at our financial wits end. And as far as the, the sales price, as far as the sales price, we have carrying costs. <laughs> that, that's how much we have in the project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Hello. Hi, are you there? Go ahead. We can hear you. Uh, hi, my name is Barbara Benish. I also live in the neighborhood. Uh, I raised my two teenagers here as well as my taking care of my elderly mom. So I understand the lady who was talking about the co-housing issues and being together as a family. I totally get it. And we all who are in the neighborhood feel, I think, um, empathy for the people who want to live here. And this isn't about an us and them thing. And it's unfortunate it's kind of deteriorated to that. Our issue, for those of us who live here, is about maintaining the community space that has been here for 130 years. It is a public space. It is a common. It has been open to the neighborhood, which is diverse and has been basically an African-American neighborhood, which is very unique in Santa Cruz for a very long time. And we, we want to maintain that. The proposition that the developers, and yes, they are developing that land, is not a community space. It's not even affordable housing if it's for 12 people. So let's try and keep it um, realistic about what that is. The, the, the proposition to have a very small open space for the community will never happen because there's such antagonism with these people who are, uh, thank you, who have bullied us that nobody will ever go into that space that lives in this community now, I promise you. Anyway, thank you for your time and for making this happen during this um, extremely uh, technological um, challenge tonight. Thank you all. Well, thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Uh, hello, my name is John Sears. I've uh, lived in the Circles neighborhood for 44 years, and um, uh, I, I'm, I, I've 
feel like um, the the main thrust of this uh, development project has not been addressed. I, if I were to look at this application, I would look at it as two separate parts. Both a plan A and plan B start with a demolition. And the demolition is the thing that I oppose because of the relationship of the church property to the neighborhood. If the neighborhood was designed in 1890, 1888, 1890, uh, to facilitate congregation of people in the middle of the circle. And it's been it's worked uh, fantastically ever since through all kinds of economic cycles. And, and even when the original building there, the tabernacle burned down, after a few years, the city of Santa Cruz recognize that by leasing it as a public park and they wanted to buy it and then the um, uh, the the church decided they wanted to build this church which is an incredible example of fitting into a public into a uh, uh, into a neighborhood in terms of if you Stand in the middle of those circles, and you look out at this at the ocean. You see land, sea, and sky. You feel enveloped in the arms of a of a sacred seconds. space. You you um, this is a would be a terrible thing to be lost, and I don't see how this has ever been addressed in this process that we are doing tonight under extreme conditions. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. The line is clear, Chair. Pardon me? The line is clear. There are no other members that have indicated they wish to speak. Okay, then what I'm going to do is close the public hearing. Um, does the applicant uh, public hearing rules have an uh, opportunity to respond? Um, I never can remember that. I'm seeing some head shaking. Does staff want to weigh in here? Does no, uh, Mr. Butler? Is that the normal rules? I didn't see it written down here, but I sort of remember that the applicant uh, normally in a public hearing has an opportunity to take um, maybe up to five minutes to respond to the public comments. Is that the case? I practice that is often the case, and it's uh, the chair's discretion in terms of the amount of time that is given to them up front um, as well as for the rebuttal. Um, and, and so, um, Oftentimes, they are provided that opportunity, and sometimes they're um, requested to not uh, bring up new issues, but only respond to those issues which have been raised. So, well, I would do that. Um, if the, we've heard since this has been, there's been so much testimony on both on all sides of the issue. Um, I would ask uh, the applicant if they'd like to have five minutes to respond to rebut any testimony that has been uh, presented. <laughs> You don't have to do it. Don't feel compelled. Mr. Packer, are you on the line? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we're happy to answer any questions, but um, we don't we don't need to respond to anything at this point. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'll bring the matter back to the commission. Uh, why don't we take commissioner's comments first? Um, anybody want to raise their hand to go first? Well, um, I'll start with you, Commissioner Spellman, since you're on my the top of the <laughs> top of the screen here. Do you have any comments you want to make? Yeah, I do. I, I want to start by um, thanking everyone for putting together the presentations tonight. I want to thank the public for, for their patience in having their voices heard. Um, 
aside from listening to people that were actually able to call in, there was quite a bit of documentation received by the commission uh, for folks commenting on this project. I just want to let you know that those were all received and, and looked at by all the commissioners. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously this is a very important, you know, parcel, piece of property. It's very unique to our city. Uh, and because of that, there, there's a lot of heartache in this community towards change and, and something different happening there. I mean, we've heard a lot of discussion on both sides of folks that support this project and folks that uh, support having that space continue as a community use. Um, I've, I've struggled with, you know, my thoughts about this, um, seeing the two proposals that were brought uh, in front of us, thinking of other options that, I, you know, I would propose if I were uh, looking at this property. Um, there are many things tied up in this, uh, not the least of which is um, we're in a housing crisis. We, we need to be extremely sensitive to housing projects that do come along. Um, and this one has the added scrutiny of being in a very public and open space. Um, so I, you know, I'm in support of the project. I actually hope that there was uh, a proposal for doing more lots on this parcel that would potentially be more in line with the existing zoning uh, parcel sizes, let's call it, in the, in the immediate vicinity of this project. Um, it's one thing that was missing from the, the documents that were submitted. Uh, there really was no delineation of the actual properties, even on this along Eret Circle on the other side of the street that front onto this parcel. If those would have been shown in relationship to the the R15 standards that um, you know are the underlying zoning in the area, you would see that those are very different sized parcels, right? They're much smaller parcels. Um, that being said, I do think we have an obligation um, to abide by the rules and have clear standards for applicants that are putting projects forward. This project has been around for a while. I think it has gone through the hearing process. I'm, I'm actually was happy that the Historic Preservation Commission had the chance to review and then the City Council had the chance to review their review essentially. Um, so I'm, I'm confident that doing a housing project here is the right thing and I will, will listen to other comments at this time. Thank you. Commissioner Nielsen? Um, yeah, um, I would, um, I, I, I agree with a lot of, um, with, um, with Commissioner Selman. Um, I, I also um, agree that about the, um, that I think that, I think, re, you know, the residential, doing a residential project here and, and is, is the right thing. Um, providing housing um, is the right thing. I think, it, I mean, I wasn't, I hadn't really thought about the smaller lots, um, you know, until you brought that up and, and also through hearing some of that uh, testimony tonight. That's an interesting idea. I mean, I don't know how, um, how that would exactly play out um, within the R15, um, but I, I'm sure there, there could be ways to do that. Um, the, um, I guess, you know, you know, for me, like, I'm having I'm having some difficulty with I, I think application number two. In for me, um, I, I think it comes down to that the the applicants have provided a um, a, a design and and pr uh, provided a, a, a proposal that fits within the um, that fits within the general in general plan and within the um, Within the zoning ordinance, and and so I have I, I'm 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 a little um, well I'm just I, I'm just not in favor of the, the city necessarily pushing on them to 
make this a, a much denser project. Uh, I, you know, I, from my perspective, I mean, I'm I, typically I'm I, when I'm sitting in, in the planning commission, I'm, I'm usually pushing for denser projects and, and you know more dense housing. And in this case, um, I, I think with a um, with an applicant that, um, that that is not desiring to go that route, I don't I don't I'm not convinced that we should be pushing them in that route and down that path. Um, I think there's you know we've received some um, correspondence from um, an experienced developer um, that stated that doing the multifamily um, project on its own would be um, could be very challenging um, and may not even be viable um, um, but, you know if, if because there was there was comments about the possibility of you know selling that you know those two parcels to a developer to actually develop that multifamily um, and um, and that correspondence we received was stating um, that 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 may not be a viable option. I mean, it, especially with the um, the uh, the requirement of the um, of the low income housing and the inclusionary housing within that, uh, and you take into account the um, kind of where we're at with um, with kind of our current situation with COVID, and um, we just you know who knows how what, exactly what's on the horizon for that. Um, so with that being said, um, I, I'm uh, I'm leaning towards um, I don't know exactly what the mechanism mechanism is in terms of how we go about or you know if there was an agreement to go with uh, application one because the recommendation is set up as um, as approving alternative B. Um, but anyway, we can discuss that um, depending on kind of where everybody stands. But um, that that's that's um, those are my comments at the moment. I I do have the, some other things, some other kind of uh, housekeeping things that I'd like to talk about. You know, when that time comes in terms of conditions and, and things like that. So I'll I'll wait until that moment. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner Maxwell. Do you have anything to add at this time? Uh, thank you. Um, I this is pretty much my first main. Uh, Big, taking a big bite here, um, as far as the meeting a meeting goes with something that's really controversial. I live on the west side, so I drive by the Circle Church all the time. Um, I, you know, I'm glad that the historic, you know, all the processes went for through the historical commission. It had their say. City council had their say. I feel like at that point we we really can't go back and change what that those decisions were um, that being said out of both of the projects that I see being you know viable as someone who lives on the west side the, the alternative one seems like to me the best option I don't really see a big condominium complex fitting in very well there um, and I definitely want to acknowledge like how much time the uh, these people have spent trying to get this project going. Um, my main concern, the only thing that really I would like to to bring up is the affordable units, the inclusionary rate, and making sure that there's something where we can hold, you know, the accountability of like, we need affordable housing. This is an opportunity. I know, uh, I don't know all the mathematics around what's feasible, what's not feasible. I've read a lot of it, but um, I definitely want to highlight that as an importance on my part. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Greenberg. Um, yeah, I, I first want to echo um, thanks to everyone for participating in this very unusual circumstance and for sharing. I know this is um, it's, it's of all of the um, kinds of things that have come before the commission, I feel like this one is kind of connected to a lot of very um, deep feeling um, that should be recognized for, for folks who live in the community there and who want to develop the space as well. Um, and, you know, also given the 
physical uh, and geographic and symbolic nature of this particular site. Um, and so it's one that we have to think about with um, an enormous amount of care. And um, so in that sense, I really appreciate, you know, all the thoughtfulness of the, of the um, comments that have been made and presentations and so forth. Um, and I guess I would say that, um, you know, thinking about the, the general plan and thinking about what happens in sites like this that have served a larger purpose you know, over a century, um, while also trying to weigh that with private property rights and so forth of people who are wanting to develop it. Um, how do we, you know, we are on this commission in a position at this point of trying to balance these competing demands, in a sense, these competing needs for the community. Um, it would be different if this was in a different site. So the, the idea that this is at the literal central, the literal heart of this community um, you know, in terms of the view shed as well as um, geography and the symbolic nature of it. So how we balance these things is something that I think a lot of us are, um, are struggling with alongside, of course, the challenge with the general plan um, of trying to maximize uh, affordable housing um, and the crisis that we're facing in, in that regard. And so as it, uh, you know, and I, I would say just to add on with some of the comments that it's true also that on the west side, this neighborhood has, you know, part of its historic nature has been as a working class uh, and more socially diverse neighborhood than, than most of the rest of Santa Cruz. And so part of our kind of challenge as commissioners also is how do you maintain um, and, and sort of prioritize that form of social diversity and sustainability, also given the proximity of this site to public transit and so forth. So in that sense, I see the density that's being um, requested on the part of the planning uh, department as in really um, in line with the, the general plan as well as the history of this community and many of the comments that were made. Um, and that, that is associated with the size of the lots surrounding um, the smaller houses, unlike on the Upper West Side and many other parts of the West Side. The fact that you know a lot of folks could move there um, and much more affordably, and the idea that that could continue to be the case with the sustainability of that affordability, which potentially could be lost if the lot size, you know, and the housing that goes there, which is not in any way um, going to be um, restricted, you know, could become a kind of speculative development on with very large lots. So I would support. Um, the proposal of the planning department to, you know, really try to ensure as much affordability as, and as much density as possible um, in that, on that site. I would also hope that there could be some kind of further discussion about how the feasibility um, of the parcel that could be used for um, for condominiums and how partnerships could be developed to, you know, if in fact the uh, circle of friends is not in a position, um, especially given the current pandemic and so forth and the, the, the time that this is taking to take that on, how could partnerships be created that could enable that? Um, seems to me something that the city could really get involved in um, and others could get involved in if this is indeed like a priority for us. Um, so that's one thing. And then the, the final thing I guess I would say is the question of the commons and the central space. And I would hope, uh, you know, that that could be an ongoing discussion as well. It's an incredible opportunity and I understand, you know, it's, uh, it's something that would have to be balanced between uh, what the uh, circle of friends is interested in and what the community needs are understood to be. But given the really special nature of this site that more thought could go into what that commons really represents and that there could be more uh, kind of collective and um, uh, collective discussion that could take place um, around how that's being thought through um, and what's going, what the elements of that common space 
are going to be and how it's designed. Um, so I think I will I'll leave it there for now, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Conway. Um, we're not able to hear you. Um, oh, sorry. I don't quite have the whole mute, unmute thing down. Um, thank you um, very much for recognizing me. And um, I, and I, I know other people have said it, but I, I'm, I need to repeat it. I really thank the uh, community for their continued engagement and their passion for this obviously very important um, property. It, it really is the heart of the circles, and uh, it matters to all of us. And I also want to thank the, um, the uh, Circle of Friends for taking on a really thoughtful project. It, I was really fascinated to hear your evolution as you went through, um, that you've gone through, um, and especially for being willing to um, step up and work with the city um, to imagine, um, you know, the alternative number two to uh, help help us to meet our really dire need for additional housing. And I want to thank city staff um, be, for your hard work to make sure that um, we, this is an important development opportunity and we need to make sure that all of our development opportunities are used to the best extent possible to meet our housing needs because we just don't have very many of them. So um, I'll stop with that and move on to affordable housing because I have to say that um, I was very disappointed initially um, that uh, the Luffy was being used and invoked on this site um, to meet the affordable housing requirement. Um, I think that that in lieu the option, it's important to have it there, but I also think that it should be used in very limited circumstances. Um, in my view, the reason why uh, an in lieu option is maintained is to uh, be used in the circumstances where um, the community benefit truly is furthered by invoking it. Um, and I'll tell you, I think that in that, that test is met um, in this case. I became convinced because um, as, I, as I watched how the task of creating this housing was being taken on, um, and I know there was a lot of debate about whether this group of people, are they experienced developers, are they not? You know, how experienced are they? How hard is development? Um, there was a lot of discussion about that. But in fact, this, the arduous task of identifying a site, purchasing it, um, carrying it throughout the period um, where the development is being envisioned um, and br to bring a, uh, something forward is really difficult. And once a map is approved, um, then the work begun begins really by individuals. And as I started to think about, well, what if we did have are um, two lots of that would be measure all lots. Um, I can't imagine um, there's going to be very many of those households who are going to have the wherewithal, um, whether it be you know the um, borrowing capacity, um, the building capacity, all of the different roles that are taken on um, when someone is building a single family house. Um, so. I, um, I think that, that it would be a fairly difficult thing to do, and I ended up feeling, or at least being open to the idea of invoking the Lucy. And I want to talk to you about that um, a little bit more because I pressed for some more information on actually suitable, imminent projects that the city has to face. But first I want to um, talk about the alternative to the multifamily par portion of the parcel. Um, and again, I do appreciate city staff trying to maximize the use of um, the land in order to do that. And I actually thought it was very well designed and attractive. 
I think it would fit in. I don't think it's a monolithic condo structure. Um, I know that, you know, things could always be done, but I thought it was very thoughtfully done and undertaken. Um, and what I really liked about it is it provided the opportunity to create what we talk about so often, a diversity of housing types. We need this. But again, um, I agree with the assessment that um, there was a letter from a local developer made um, that building a, uh, con a, a condominium project like this with ADUs is a fundamentally different undertaking even than building a single family house, which is not easy. The borrowing for it is completely different. Insuring it, taking it on as a builder, it's a very different kind of a deal. And the other thing is that this project, I don't believe this project would pencil, even if it didn't have the number of affordable units um, that are being proposed there. I just don't think it would with our, who knows what's gonna happen, be true on the other side of this, but our construction costs are very, very high. Um, and uh, because of that, I really think that even if the land were free, which you know the owners have told us they can't possibly do, I still think it would be really difficult to um, uh, to build that property and um, and make it pencil at all. Um, so then I want to go back to the in Luffy. Um, I actually called um, Jessica Dewitt actually for a couple of reasons. Partly I wanted to talk about about our committee, which we'll talk about later. But um, I wanted to know um, how there's, there's a lot of, of multifamily properties um, on the horizon right now. And the one that we've talked a little bit in the commission is the, um, uh, the Pacific uh, Station. I think that's what we're calling it now. Um, that is the one that by the Metro Station. That is 85 units of deeply affordable housing. And I think, um, I'm convinced that at this moment in time, building up the Inlufis, building up the capacity to make investments in really deeply targeted units is the best thing uh, that we could do um, at this time. And so for that reason, um, for the long-winded uh, way to say, I have really become convinced that um, the project that we have before us um, in option number one uh, creates housing. I, w I thought that they were awfully big for the neighborhood too, but they're smaller than they are in many, many neighborhoods. Um, 5,000 square foot lots, thoughtfully designed, um, building community, um, and I think that they should all have ADUs. I'm really glad there's an intention to be. I'd be open for a reasonable way um, to uh, enhance that expectation. Um, but that is the uh, project that I'll be supporting. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Dawson? Yes, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll keep my thank yous brief, but I did would like to just, as the other commissioners, just echo my thanks uh, for everyone's participation and thoughtfulness around this project, staff, um, the circle of friends, and certainly hearing from the community members has been really important. Um, I do want to go circle back to this idea of inclusionary housing and um, the ability of this project to provide two um, to affordable units uh, based on the calculation. I think it's um, incredibly important to move forward quickly with this. Pacific Station and some of the other projects mentioned are out on the horizon, but that horizon could be quite extended. And there are a lot of um, things that have to happen and be approved to aggregate those funds and get those projects moving. So I really feel like um, I am not in support of in, in loose use for this project. And um, I think one of the reasons that I'm not in support of in loose use for this project um, is that I don't feel that this 
project meets our definition in our inclusionary ordinance of a co-housing development. Um, I think it's a, mostly co-housing in name only. Um, things like the community, the community shared space. Um, there's there's nothing in the maps or the documentation that we have in front of us that really clearly delineate this as a co-housing. There are many definitions of co-housing, I understand that, but some of the core tenets of co-housing aren't really clear in the documentation that we have. And so, Mr. Dawson, we lost you. Are you still with us? Are you on your phone? Can you hear can you hear me, uh, Commissioner Dawson? Looks like we may have lost her on her phone call. Give her a moment to Okay. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your patience. I'm back. Sorry, everybody. Not sure what happened there. Um, but the short of it is I'm not in support of in fees for this project because I do not believe that this project meets our uh, inclusionary uh, definition in our, in our ordinance. And I would really uh, support moving forward with an amendment to the conditions um, requiring the applicant to meet some, some key points um, related to our co-housing uh, definition um, that would include the common building being constructed um, prior to or concurrent with the first dwelling unit, um, some documentation and our CCNRs that could include some things related to sharing sharing of space, um, how, how community decisions are going to be made. Um, I have specifics on those, but I, again, I think it's just incredibly important for us as a community to think about having affordable units um, throughout our community. And this is an, this is a very desirable location. Um, it's, it's, convenient to a lot of uh, different types of employment um, further over on the west side in the commercial space and downtown. So having two affordable units uh, I think would be uh, really important in this space. You've heard from several community members um, and, and some of the other commissioners about how this has been traditionally a working class area. Um, it's a, there are a lot of creative ways um, people can finance different things. Um, and so I think just precluding it because it might be challenging, I don't think is the right approach. And I'll leave it there for comments from other commissioners. And when we get to it, um, I do have specific language around um, amending uh, the condition. And generally, um, before I uh, turn it back over, um, as I said in my earlier comments, I think it's incredibly important for us as a commission to be um, transparent and predictable in how we um, evaluate uh, development proposals. Um, the applicant has come forward with a proposal that meets all the required elements with um, the Housing Accountability Act. Uh, we are um, mandated to approve those types of proposals. So I feel like our hands are tied with this 
this overriding state law. And so I am supportive of Alternative 1 with um, the amended conditions related to the in lieu fee. But that would only be used if they met a higher standard of proof for it being a co-housing development. And I'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much. Uh, I do have a number of comments. I'm sure that isn't going to surprise anyone. Um, when I first started uh, thinking about the fact that this was going to actually be in front of us tonight, um, I thought there'd be a lot, I'd have a much more difficult time figuring out what to do. Um, but then when I finally read the material, I had followed the discussions at the Historical Preservation Commission and the Council about the historical designation, and it seemed clear to me that that really wasn't an issue that we could change. Um, I, I think it may be, in, I think there are lots of good arguments for why um, this is a culturally significant site, why it might be a starkly important site, but that's a decision that the council made, and only the council can change it, as far as I'm concerned. I don't think it's our role to second guess the council on, uh, on, on this matter. So while I have a good deal of sympathy with the, um, the, the desire to um, de designate this as a historically important uh, site and building, I don't think that – I wouldn't support us trying to make that as a recommendation because I think the council already acted on it and they're the final uh, decision makers on that. I do feel the other thing that I thought uh, would be more difficult was um, when I saw the two alternatives that the staff had come up with, it was sort of like, well, what should go there? Should it be alternative one? Should it be alternative two? Should it be uh, smaller lots, more lots, more – there are, you know, there are lots of ways of looking at this site. Uh, should it be a, some kind of a community facility? But it really comes down to what is our legal role in making these decisions? Um, as far as I'm concerned, traditionally the role has been if a, if a project doesn't need a change in the general plan or a change in the zoning ordinance in order to happen, where we have a lot more discretion, what we really need to do is look at whether it's consistent with the general plan and whether it's consistent with the zoning ordinance. If it's consistent with the general plan, consistent with the zoning ordinance, then we really need to approve it. Now, historically, some of the issues that in, were involved with that was were around is it compatible to the neighborhood. Uh, traditionally, that would be an, a way of trying to look at some alternative approaches to this site. But the state legislature and governor have really changed the playing field. Um, we are required to follow the law. Um, we're acquire, required to follow the law in terms of general plan and zoning ordinance, and we're also required to follow state law, whether I like it or not. And the Housing Account Accountability Act is extremely clear, and I disagree with the interpretation that the planning director has um, provided that somehow um, where the, where the um, act The staff report says, and I think it's pretty clear that it does, the City Council or Planning Commission must vote to approve the application. The application is for 11 units. It's not – the application isn't the project which is staff defining it as 16 units. Um, that's not the application. The application is for 11 units. The state law says we must vote to approve it. I don't like – that restriction. I don't like that the, that the discretion of the city has been um, re reduced that greatly, but I think that that's, uh, that's the way it is. I mean, that's, I, I don't see we ha that we have any discretion. If we acted in a, in a way that was contrary to the law, we're essentially um, exposing the city to liability. The letter from the attorney for the Circle of Friends makes that abundantly clear. He quotes the act, he quotes that position, and I think it would be very difficult to say somehow changing the project 
is this, by changing the project, project, we could still be approving the application. It's not the application. It's the simple meaning of the words are very clear. So I think we're, um, in terms of the, six, the, uh, the, uh, the 12 unit subdivision, I think that it's pretty clear that we need to recommend approval of that. Unless there's some general plan or zoning standard that somebody can argue and nobody in the testimony has argued uh, is being violated or that there's some significant adverse impact to public health and safety. No one has made provided testimony to that effect. So I think it's pretty clear what, um, what our jurisdiction is when it comes to that. Along those lines, I want to say that I have real concerns that the planning develop, the PD process is being used essentially in my view, and I know no one will like my, or many will not like my words, as a, to make a mockery out of our general plan and zoning ordinance. If we wanted to start having multi-family housing in single-family neighborhoods, we should amend the general plan and the zoning ordinance to do that. We should not be gerrymandering that in through the PD, which, as proposed by staff, not only imposes multifamily housing in a single-family neighborhood, contrary to, to the zoning ordinance, but it also creates substandard lots. It seems incredible to me that we'd be using the, when we have so, there are so many difficulties with substandard lots and development on substandard lots, and yet we're, uh, the staff is recommending that we do that. I think this need or this, this um, attachment to the planning, the general plan policy that we should allow or encourage ma maximum family uh, multifamily density, uh, high density housing is leading the, the city in a direction of it doesn't matter what anybody wants to do anywhere, we want to have the highest density possible. And I think um, that's a mistake. I think it's particularly a mistake since the council very recently uh, adopted a policy that neighborhood protection was important and has to be balanced. This is a perfect, a perfect situation where um, the imposition of multifamily housing in this neighborhood uh, is contrary to the notion of neighborhood preservation. So in the end, uh, clearly I support the uh, applicant's uh, application. I do want to also agree with Commissioner Dawson about the uh, inclusionary housing. I think it's really important that we, um, that we get inclusionary units. I understand and I think I, I, don't, I, I don't fault staff for wanting to have fees, um, but there are certain things I would point out. I think the beginning of Commissioner Conway's presentation was really clear. The ordinance, um, the inclusionary ordinance really anticipates that uh, um, the, the inmate fees will only be used in, in an infrequent and when they use, they should be clearly creating more units than they would have otherwise uh, had, to, had to create, at least one or 30 percent more. That's what the ordinance says. The ordinance requires the city to make a finding before uh, allowing in, in lieu fees. Um, I don't think that finding can be made because there is no project. If there was a project before the city, um, that was uh, application had been submitted. If there was evidence that that application, that project needed the in lieu fees in order for it to happen, uh, for it to be uh, feasible, those would be much stronger arguments. On the other hand, the, the inclusionary ordinance is clear that for co-housing projects, um, the, the applicant gets to make the choice. It's not the city's choice. If it's a co-housing project, then it doesn't matter whether the city council, uh, whether we recommend the two units or the city council recommends the two units, it's the applicant's choice. That's what the uh, uh, inclusionary ordinance says for co-housing projects. But I think the point that Commissioner Dawson made is a very good one. From reading over the material, from reading over the CC&Rs, from reading over the conditions, this really looks like a subdivision. I understand that the intention of the 
applicants is for the vehicle housing project as traditional housing projects are. I'm not unsympathetic to that, but I've had enough experience knowing that um, the best intentions before the decision-making body at stage one don't get implemented necessarily in stage two. So I think um, it really would make sense to me to have the conditions be much clearer about what, what, would ha what the project would have to be like to assure that it's in fact a co-housing project. And as, it, as I understand it, at this point, there's no requirement when the common building be built. Um, and it could never be built. It's there. It's supposed to be built, but there's no requirement that it be built before or concurrently with the uh, market rate units or the the, uh, the subdivision units. There's no requirement that there be. Uh, there certainly not. There may be that the governing documents were not um, in the um, in the packet. So there may well be requirements in the government documents or provisions in the government documents that would talk about the, the, the need for the, or the availability of shared meals or shared facilities in the common room, um, in the common building. I think that I think there could very well be evidence that this is truly a co-housing project. I just don't think the evidence is there yet. And because the evidence is not there, I think it makes sense to say, well, if this is going to be really um, cracking like a subdivision, it should be treated like a subdivision, not like a co-housing project. And the city should require that uh, the two units of affordable housing be, uh, be, be, uh, be included at, to meet the requirement. So my sense, um, my, my my preference is to um, approve the, the, the application that is before us because we really don't have any choice. We have to approve, recommend approval, um, and, but that we uh, um, change the conditions, uh, uh, revise the condition number 35, which is the inclusionary housing condition, to really say, one, if there's going to be, if, you, if this is a co-housing project, this is the evidence that needs to be provided to document that. If it's not a co-housing project, then I think um, the, the inclusionary requirement should be met by providing two affordable units. So um, all of the commissioners have had a chance to speak. Does somebody want to uh, make a motion? You know, I, I wanted to make a oh. A statement, okay. Uh, all right. Just wanted. I won't have a, if I necessarily have to go right into a motion, uh, and yeah, weigh in if they would like to. Go ahead, Commissioner Conway. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, I think I'm off mute, getting used to this technology. Um, I um, appreciate the uh, thoughts on uh, this pro this project functioning as co-housing. I, to me, I'm very convinced, mostly because it is not being undertaken as a typical subdivision um, with this, you know, circle of people who've undertaken it. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily against further definition around that. I am concerned about um, the additional financial burden um, and how that, or rather, um, I want them to build out everything um, that makes it co-housing that makes it the community property they've talked about. Um, but we, this is a really sensitive time financially, and I'm aware of that. Um, but as to the in lieu fees, I do think that it would be, and I, don't, I wouldn't say I want to require it, but uh, ha having them pay their in lieu fees early in order to help the city um, qualify to use their FB2 money, which is called the Permanent Local Housing Allocation, um, to commit it to the, um, the Housing Trust Fund, would be really important and really meaningful at this time. So um, I'm not meaning to be contradictory. I, both, I, I am sensitive to the uh, financial nightmare they're going to be, everyone's, everyone's going to be dealing with coming out of this. But at the same time, I really want to emphasize how important and how meaningful it would be 
to um, be able to leverage 85 deeply affordable rental units downtown, right where the, right where we need them. So um, I, I I just want to make that point, and I I'm not not willing to bake that into a motion. Um, but that said, I am ready to make a motion in support of alternative A. And I don't have the... Are you, are you making that a motion? Yes. To, yes. Second to the motion? I'll second that motion. Okay. Uh, so the motion is to, I assume your motion is to the staff recommendation, um, but for uh, alternative number one. Is that correct? That's right. That's correct. Discussion on the motion. And that would be with the, okay, Commissioner Dawson. Um, I'm not sure the parliamentary procedure. Can I offer an amendment now or are we past that point? No, we're not past the point. A motion's on the floor. It's legitimate for... Yes, I... Um... iPad perhaps maybe separate it okay chair we're going to keep you unmuted and you can continue okay um, as I was saying it's appropriate to make a, a motion to amend the motion on the floor um, and it could be taken as a friendly amendment or um, it, if it's not taken by the by the maker of the motion and, this, and the person who seconded it is a friendly amendment you can make it as a motion to amend, and if somebody seconds it, it can be voted on. So do you want to make to amend? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yes. What's the motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion to amend, um, again, around getting further documentation uh, in support of this being a co-housing project. Um, so it would be uh, condition 35, and I would move to strike um, towards the end, it says, and in lieu fee, I would motion to strike everything after that, and then I would insert after an in lieu fee, I would insert, will be used only if the applicant can provide sufficient evidence documenting that the development meets the zoning ordinance definition of a co-housing project, um, and and um, Tess and Sarah, I also have emailed this to you. If that may help. Perfect. I have um, okay. And so you received the email. So do I need to continue reading this? I probably need to read it anyway for the public. Correct. Okay. If there's more to your motion, you need to read it out loud. Okay, so that was the first part. So we're going to have an, an in lieu fee will be used only if the applicant per, can provide sufficient evidence documenting that the development meets the zoning ordinance definition of a co-housing project. Evidence documenting that the development meets the definition for a co-housing project shall include the common building shall be constructed prior to or concurrent with the first dwelling unit and shall include extensive common facilities for communal uses uh, where community members can interact and share facilities. May include a dining area, a sitting area, a children's playroom and, and or a guest room. Um, number two, the governing document and or CCNR shall include, but not limited to, 
the following provisions, uh, frequently scheduled congreg congregations um, related to managing the property. Um, and then a non-hierarchical structure for decision making where decisions are made through consensus. And then moving on, if the development does not meet the definition of a co-housing project based on substantial evidence, the following inclusionary requirement shall apply. As a minimum, two affordable units shall be provided prior to or concurrent with the market rate units. The first affordable unit shall be sold prior to the concurrent with the sale of the first market rate unit. The second affordable unit shall be sold prior to and concurrent with the sale of the sixth market rate unit. So that's a lot. Um, but again, it's it's just requiring um, well, docu me, documentation on the co-housing. Go ahead. Um, first, the question is, does the maker of the motion accept this as a friendly amendment? We're not hearing you. Turn off your mute. You have to come back in. And we don't, okay, we have everybody. Did you want to say something? Yes, thank you, Chair Schifrin. Um, one of the things that I would um, say in response to that um, very last part, I want to clarify that the, the development application for, um, or it shouldn't, it's really the map application that is uh, before the commission for alternative one um, just does the subdivision. And so that uh, the uh, specifics of that condition spoke to um, actually um, providing the units when um, with the map being the application before us, um, it would be uh, tied to actually dedication of the parcels. Um, so those two parcels would be sold at an affordable price um, to, um, you know, a, a nonprofit developer, for example. Um, or to someone who is income qualified who could go through and actually get the, um, uh, the financing for uh, building a house on the lot that they acquire at a uh, below market rate. Um, so there's, there's a little so bit of thing uh, that you, It would be a matter of substituting the word parcel for the word unit. Yes, uh, it would be to the maker of the amended motion. Yes, that's correct. So we could substitute that word parcel for the word unit. And I, I think it would be helpful to get, um, Sarah, I'm not sure if you've got that and if you're able to share your screen, I think it might be helpful for um, everyone to actually see that written out. Um, yeah, because it uh, I don't see it yet in my email. Ms. DeLeon at CityofSanJuan.com. Are you on it, sir? Um, Peter, I, I see your hand, but um, we're sort of in a, <laughs> it's a strange situation because essentially we have a proposed amendment to the motion with a question to the maker of the main motion whether she wants to accept it or not before we know whether we have an, uh, 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 an amended motion that we can really talk about. So, Okay, and sure, I think I I'm back on. Okay. Um, yep. And of course, I, um, I missed everything that was said since I was dropped off, um, but I did hear um, Commissioner Dawson's um, proposal for amendments. Okay. And um, as to the, um, you know, the clarification about the co-housing structure um, and, you know, in the CCNRs, looking for, the, for the, those definitions, I will definitely accept those as friendly amendments. 
I am concerned that the first one requiring the construction, um, you know, concurrently and right away um, could endanger the project feasibility. So I am concerned about that one, and I wouldn't be accepting that as a friendly amendment. Everything else I'm, I'm good and in support of. So, um, Commissioner Dawson, are you prepared to um, change your amended motion to only include those portions of it that have to do with uh, CCNRs and uh, governing documents? Or, or do you want to stick with your full motion? I, I, I'm going to stick with my motion. Um, I understand Commissioner Conway's concerns, but I really do feel, um, that, again, there are many definitions of co-housing, but one that has been universal in all of my research has been having a shared space. Um, from the beginning of, of the habitation of that location. And so well, I let, think- Before we get into it, um, okay. let's see if, it, there, if somebody will second your motion. Is anybody willing to second the motion uh, to amend the motion on the floor? Can I ask a question about it first? Yes. I just want to clarify. So the applicant at this point goes uh, your amendment would not come into play unless they chose to go for the in lieu fee option. If they chose to not do the in lieu fee, they wouldn't have to abide by the, the co-housing setup or definitions or meet the intent. Okay. Yeah, I just, I'm not sure if the applicant is ready for that. I mean, I think they have a spirit of co-housing with, with what I've understood about their project. I don't know that the, the, the definition of you know, the zoning ordinance is, is what is at play here. Um, so does that mean you're unwilling to uh, second the motion, Commissioner Spellman? Or will you second the motion? Yeah, I, I too have concerns about conditioning the building of the, the common space structure. I, I am in support of the spirit of um, greater scrutiny on making a co-housing proposal. I'm, I'm in support of that. I'm just not in support of the, the phasing and making sure it's built first. Well, is, will another commissioner uh, second the motion? I will second that motion. Okay, so the, the motion to amend is on the floor. Um, let's have discussion, more discussion motion. Let me just say, one of the problems here is, and because it, it is such a difficult time, and uh, the, financial, the financial realities are so um, volatile, it's unclear to me uh, what will happen with this project. Um, I know what the, um, what the Circle of Friends want to do, and it's very laudable in my view. Um, it's a, it, I think it would be, uh, you know, given that, the, that the, it, there's not a way to have a community facility there, the, having a co-housing project makes sense. But I've just had a couple, enough bad experiences that once a project has its discretionary approval, the value of the, of the property goes up so horrendously that no, you, you never can figure out what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they will be able to develop it as they intend, but my sense is, at least in terms of the inclusionary housing, um, if that turns out not to be feasible for some reason or other, and ultimately all that exists is a single family uh, subdivision with a common room or a community room, um, then I think it's, you know, for my, my preference would be to uh, be assured that we would get those uh, uh, additional affordable units. So I, I'm willing to support this, the amended motion. Um, any other commissioner comments? Can everybody read the motion? Well, 
Well, that's one good thing about this technology. At least um, we all get to see what we're voting on <laughs> instead of. <coughs> um, actually, I can't. Can, can you hear me? Go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Um, can it be enlarged? I can't see it, and I can't seem that my. I don't see a way of enlarging it on my screen, but I may be missing. Do you have a um, a little box at the upper right, like a little square? If you clicked on that, that sometimes lets you take over your full screen if you have an I think I should have my glasses is the problem. <laughs> well, but, that could... Oh, that's better. Thank you. Okay. They were able to enlarge it. Thank you. Control. Now you have to be able to move down through it. Yeah, just let us know when you guys want to scroll. I'm sorry. I couldn't understand you. Just let us know when you guys want us to scroll down. Are you ready to scroll down, Commissioner Greenberg? Um, one second, Sean Turner. Um, yes. Say when you're ready for it to be scrolled further. Okay. So please scroll it down further. Could we make the change in the language to reflect that it's two affordable parcels shall be provided as opposed to units since we're related to alternative one? Please. Okay. Well, you don't have to write it, but we'll just um, <coughs> two affordable parcels shall be provided prior to the um, provided to or concurrent with uh, the sale of the market rate uh, uh, parcels. And then just substitute parcel for unit. So is that clear to everyone what the what the motion is? Yeah, can I ask a question? Definitely, Commissioner Nielsen. Uh, at the beginning of the beginning of the motion, or sorry, beginning of this um, the text, it talks about the definition of a co-housing project um, based on the ordinance. Do we have um, that language somewhere? I have it right in front of me. I, um, I can read it if you. Is it from? Are you, are you pulling it directly from the municipal code? Yes. It's in can the, you tell me what section? Can you uh, tell me what section it is in the definitions? Very uh, affordable housing um, section that deals with inclusionary, and it's one of the definitions. And the okay, what section? Can you tell me what section it is? Could you, is it possible to send a link to that? Um, if you guys give me a moment, or if Lee or Ryan is on the line, and you can give me the code, I could bring it up right here. Uh, it's section 2416-2416010. Um, 2416 and the definition is 2416015. Yeah, we're unmuted now. That's correct. Do you want me to read it for you, or would you rather bring it up? Go ahead. You can read it, but I'm also going to pull it up. Okay. Um, the co-housing development definition, it's, it's an intentional community of private dwelling units clustered around shared space. Each attached or single-family home has traditional amenities, including a private kitchen. Um, shared spaces typically feature a common house, which may include a large kitchen and dining area, laundry and recreational spaces. Households collabor collaboratively plan and manage shared spaces. The legal structure is typically an HOA, 
condo association or housing cooperative? And the problem I have with, with the project is that there's no, um, there's nothing in the CCNRs or in the conditions that really um, carry that out. And I think that that's why I'm supportive of the uh, amended motion because it does make it clear that to be a, co uh, uh, you know, to be a legitimate co-housing project, there needs to be a common structure. There needs to be some shared activities. And I think that's what's being um, required if the develop the applicant wants to pay, you know, wants to have the option of deciding whether to pay in lieu fees or not. Otherwise, it doesn't matter whether it's a co-housing project or not, um, because there's no particular benefit from being a co-housing project, except that it allow that I can see, except that it allows the the applicant to not have to pay and not have to provide the units, the affordable units on site. So. Yes, Commissioner Nielsen, you it, want to continue? It, yeah, I'm just, I have a question. Is it required within the, the ordinance that um, that co-housing, or sorry, that that, um, that shared facility is built prior to um, the rest of the units or houses? I wouldn't say it's required, but it's certainly implied. I mean, how are you going to have shared um, activities if you don't have a shared space? Um, but if, I mean, if, if, if I mean, unless, I, I mean, maybe, maybe I need to look somewhere other than, other than the definitions for that, but, um, but I, I understand that, that, I mean, I understand what, I understand the concept of, uh, of having a communal space, um, for everyone to use, um, but I also, um, I, I, I share concerns, um, similar to, um, Commissioner Conway uh, regarding um, the ability of of having that built prior to the um, prior to the, the residential units um, or conditioning that it has to be done that way. Um, so um, so that's where I stand on that. Would you what would you think would be a legitimate amount of time before the um, the common space was provided. So you're, I think the concern that both you and Commissioner Conway raised is sort of the financial concern. On the other hand, if, that, if the common building is never built, it's really not a co-housing project as far as I'm concerned. So at some point, it needs to be built. Right. What's, what's a reasonable amount of time? Uh, well, I mean, I think, you know, obviously with uh, that's a that's a difficult one to say at the moment. Um, but maybe maybe there's some way to to maybe there's a way to 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 do it where it doesn't have to do. Maybe it's more along the lines of a certain number of houses are completed. Um, you know, you know, you can always. I mean, I think that was one of the conditions that was that was provided uh, originally having to do with the multifamily was that there was some condition that those single family homes could be built prior to, but only a certain number. And then, you know, within that, then, you know, the, you know, you could have the, you can't final out the, the remaining until the communal house or the communal um, space is completed. Um, maybe something like that would be more acceptable um, just because, you know, I, I think, you know, at, at this stage, it's hard to say how it, it, financially where things are, are going. Um, and, you know, I guess with that being said, also the, the ability of building single family is, you know, even just doing that is, um, is, is questionable at the moment in terms of how that, what exactly what the market's going to do. And, how things are going to play out. So at least tying it to the construction, you know, uh, happening around with, you know, um, or within the time frame of, you know, these houses being completed is, I think, is acceptable. But I don't necessarily think it has to be right away or, like, prior to them even starting or being completed. Uh, 
Hey, let me I'll make a procedural point. Um, I can't see all the commissioners, so if you want to, oh. there's a place if you do manage participants where you can raise your hand and um, you can click on that button and I'll know that you want to speak. I saw uh, Commissioner Dawson wanted to speak, um, and so I'm going to call on her next, and then I see Commissioner Spellman. But you should be everybody should be okay. able to raise their hand, and then Commissioner Conway. Okay. So, okay. Commissioner Dawson, did you want to speak? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, again, um, this is just to try and provide the opportunity for the applicant to support that this is a co-housing development because otherwise it's just a it's just a subdivision and mm -hmm. the the benefit in the code of being a co-housing development is the applicant gets to decide just as a chair Schifrin said and so um i i feel i feel that um i'm, I'm happy to potentially uh tweak this language um based on on uh suggestions from other commissioners to address some of their concerns but um, as long as uh, you know the intent is that that uh, we provide some sideboards around the co-housing part of this project um, so that they can clearly provide that that evidence and and it function as a co-housing development okay um, Commissioner Spellman you were next yeah I think potentially saying the building of the common facility, maybe we push it to, you know, halfway through the project at a minimum, right? Is that so except the six slots or of the motion? Six slots could be built, but at least yes. the heat off of having to build that right away. Okay. And then I just wanted to clarify, is can, can staff speak to the point about the in-lieu fees in general uh, in relationship to the co-housing co gives you that vehicle? I'm just not familiar with that that code. You're allowed that choice if it is in fact a co-housing development. So there is clear language um, related to co-housing developments. Um, the co-housing development, um, based on our initial analysis, has a substantially higher affordable housing in lieu fee than it would for the project if it were considered a, uh, a standard uh, subdivision. And so that's our initial analysis. I mean, it was on the order of 300,000 more. I'm, I'm looking at yeah, as we have oh, distance in the room here. <laughs> over that, um, and the, the original intention of the, <laughs> the original intention no. Behind that piece is that it, it's it's lumped in with assisted living, um, you know. It's sort of the like like student co-op housing. It's it's more of a um, it's supposed to be more affordable by design, and because it's sort of a separate, a very unique uh, living concept, if you want to call it that. Uh, the dis I mean, I didn't make this code, but the, the ordinance was written so that it was based off of square footage versus off of, um, you know, sort of an appraised value of, uh, you know, how we normally do our measure, our measure out. So it ends up being a higher fee is what we're, what we're getting at. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, I think fun, I didn't uh, make this. But to your question about where it is and, and read you the language, it's in section 2416.030, um, number six uh, applies to in lieu fees. And then section A4 says for residential development that the approval body determines are assisted living, co housing developments, congregate living, or live work units, the applicant may elect to pay in lieu fees for the entire inclusionary require, uh, unit requirement. So um, that's the section that really we have to determine that, uh, that uh, or the city council ultimately has to determine that it's a co-housing project. And I think the intent of the motion is to, you know, clarify, provide uh, evidence that in fact it is a co-housing project. And if it, it does provide that evidence, then it's up to the applicant. The applicant could decide that they want to 
uh, provide the units, but it's up to them, not the city. Otherwise, it's up to the, the approval body, and the approval body ultimately would be the city council. We would just, our, uh, if, this, if this amendment, uh, if this or, uh, motion passes and, it, and the final motion passes, it's just a, rec it, it's a recommendation to the council. The council makes the final decision. Chair Does that answer your This is the clerk. Yeah. I just wanted to let you know that um, Commissioner Conway has her hand up, as does the applicant. Um, I'll, I didn't know about that applicant. I knew about Commissioner Conway, uh, but Commissioner Spellman had the floor first. I want to make sure he's finished. And then I'll hear. Yeah, essentially. I mean, I, I am in support of having the inclusionary unit be built on site. So I think my hope is that that's the route the applicant will take, and I am in support of putting more weight behind the option of doing the in-lieu fees. Okay, uh, Commissioner Conway? And I think I might need some clarification on that, um, Commissioner Spellman, on, on what you just said. Um, I am very much in support of the clarification about co-housing. I think the spirit of co-housing runs very strongly um, throughout this proposal. Um, uh, I appreciate the idea of pegging it rather to some time period, which is often what we'll see. It'll be like within X years. We have so much uncertainty right now that instead tying it to, um, you know, it needs to be done by the time some certain number of, um, of uh, units are built. Um, I, w I would be in favor of that. I do think we need to be really careful that the recommendations that we're making right now really could make this project impossible to build. And so that's what I'm sensitive to. Um, my thought was going was going to be that um, the community built space, which is really key, and I just want to be clear that I'm very much in support of it, and I think it's a big part of this, um, that it needs to be done um, by the time unit, I don't know, uh, you said unit six. I was leaning a little more towards, you know, unit eight, but later in the project would need to get built. Well, the motion is to state unit six, the six unit, the six unit. Okay. All right. I, I would go with that. We're making all sorts of uh, changes to the conditions that and we're And we haven't even voted on it yet. Yeah. So let's hear what the applicant has to say in response to these, the proposed. This is what we're talking about is simply the, mo the amended motion that's on the floor. So I would ask you to keep your um, your comments to that, if you would. So who, who's speaking for the applicant? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Who's speaking? Hi, this is Brett Packer. And okay. I very much appreciate you guys recognizing me. Um, and appreciate the discussion. So, um, we um, are very much a co-housing group and have become very solidified through the two and a half years we've been working together. And the central shared area um, is the main place we will interact and our intention and desire um, is to have a common area to um, share meals and share art and events and has been from the beginning and we may well be in a difficult position with the COVID crisis in order to build that and my concern is that tying it to building of homes is that, um, you know, what do we say to our group? Well, eight of you can build your home or six of you can build your home. And then um, if we don't have the money to build the common building, the other four can camp in the center. You know, it, it, it creates a real challenge. We don't know how it's going to go. We want to build the building. That's our intention. Um, our intention is also to do 
sort of what's best for the city for the inclusionary fees. It, it is good for us. It's simpler is really what it comes down to. I, I think it's probably the same amount of money. It's very challenging for us to come up with that money as soon as um, it's likely needed, but we're going to do everything we can to make that happen. And um, my biggest concern I want to raise here is that tying the building of the building doesn't necessarily define us as co-housing. We haven't developed our um, CCNRs yet. Those are kind of a placeholder that's in there now. Um, they will be developed, and they will be reflecting um, aspects of co-housing in terms of things we share and time we spend together and um, how we share the common space, as well as how people enter the um, the group but in terms of, you know, how we maintain the group as, as things change over time. Um, it, that's important to us, too, that this thing keep going. Um, you know, the current group is, is super solid, and we're hopeful to set up the CCNR so it maintains that over, the, over time. So I, I'm fine with, um, you know, developing those uh, before we get to city council. Um, if just I want you guys to know that it's our intention to build that building um, as soon as we can. Um, it's, it's very important to us, uh, and it's important to what we're doing there. But it, to tie it to building homes uh, feels like uh, dangerous and something we – we don't know how bad this COVID thing is going to be. Right now it looks like it's going to be really bad economically. And we're going to be challenged just to get houses on the ground to get our families in there. So that's just what I want to say. And I, I do appreciate you guys, your discussion on all this and all your thoughts. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I think to clarify the, the um, CCNRs and documents would need to be a, uh, clear to meet the condition at the time of the building permits, not necessarily at the time that it goes to the city council. If the city council approves the uh, the the uh, if, if the motions pass and the council approves it, then it would be um, the, the the applicant would have until they come in with their final map, I guess, to or even the building permits for starting to build it to to, to show that they are that they've met the requirement uh, uh, about uh, changes to the governing document. I, I think my fun, you know, I, I was on the planning commission for eight years in the, in the 80s. And one of the hardest lessons for me to learn from that experience is how easy it is to, or how important it is to recognize that once the permit is approved, once the conditions are added to the permit, that is all that the applicant, the developer, has to meet. And while they may want to meet all sorts of other things and they have all sorts of concerns, that's what they have to meet. And let me say that the city has been very um, understanding of applicants if, as they go through the process and they're, you know, they're still having problems and it's up to the sixth, sixth, sixth uh, house and they need more time, they can come in and ask for an amendment to their permit. It's in the permit that they have to build the house by the sixth unit if this, if this motion passes. If that turns out to be infeasible and they have good reasons for not being able to do it when the time comes, they can come and ask the city for more time. That happens all the time, that developers need more time to do what they're required to do. However, if they're not required to do it, there may never be a common building. And therefore, I think it's important if we uh, – agree that um, the, it's essential for a co-housing project to have a common building, the condition should require them to provide one. And so let's see if there's any more, uh, if anybody Chris, else. This is the clerk. I'm sorry, but our bylaws require that when the meeting goes to 11, you need to have a motion to extend to adjourn to a specific time. You know, we're having so much fun. It's 11 o'clock. We feel like <laughs> Let us go for another 15 minutes, and maybe we can vote on this. Yes, I make a motion to extend the meeting for another 15 minutes. 
Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. second. All in favor say aye. 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 Knows. I won't do a roll call on this one. Okay, so let's try to see if there's any more. There's, an, there's a, a motion on the floor to essentially approve the staff recommendation, I think, for uh, option A, alternative A. There's an amended motion on the floor to make um, a, uh, revise the condition number 35 having to do with the, with the inclusionary units. Is there further discussion on that amended motion? Okay, let's let's uh Could I get clarification? Conway, go ahead. I just want to get clarification. We just had a discussion that um, part of that amendment is to uh, require that the community meet all of the co housing pieces and require that the shared space is built um, at the time that the sixth home is approved. Yes. Is, is that what we agreed to? Yeah. Okay. I will accept that as a friendly amendment. Um, Commissioner Nielsen, will you, as a seconder, accept that as a friendly amendment? Yes. Okay, so the motion on the floor now includes the staff recommendation on option, uh, on alternative A, with the uh, uh, revised condition number 35. Is there further discussion on, as, um, as it's been revised both uh, initially and then through amendments in terms of uh, substituting parcels for uh, units and extending the time for provision of the uh, common building until a sixth unit is as the subdivision. Uh, before we vote on it, I see the planning hand up. Um, what would you like to say? Thank you, Commissioner. Planning Schiffer. Director. Uh, thank you, Chair Schifrin. Um, the comment that uh, we were discussing here with uh, Jessica DeWitt and myself was surrounding the timing for the sale of the units, um, or, or excuse me, the sale of the parcels. Um, I, I think it may be worth um, hearing from the applicant if they have concerns about that timing. Um, particularly given um, some of the concerns that Jessica was raising and uh, that very well could be the case in terms of getting someone who is actually income qualified. Um, I, I think that um, that could be a challenge to someone. Um, there may be a, a Habitat for Humanity, um, if, uh, but I understand there is, uh, I think uh, Brett Packer or someone spoke earlier and said that there wasn't an interest from Habitat for Humanity. And, and so, um, but I, I think um, if it pleases the chair and the commission, um, that may be something that the, the applicant wants to speak to in terms of that timing. I'm happy to hear from the applicant. I expect that the applicant will not like that provision, <laughs> but my sense is that the provision that a lot that that for the co-housing is one th that the revision that would allow this project to go forward as a co-housing project would mean that the applicant would be able to choose paying the, uh, the in-lay right. fee. So, um, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, if the applicant really feels the need to speak, um, I'll be ha I'm willing to let the applicant respond to the concern that you raised. Otherwise, um, I'm not, I, I, think it's, I think it's unlikely that that's the option that's going to turn out. And, from my perspective, that's the way to assure that we get the affordable units if the affordable units have to be um, provided. So it's what we're here for is looking out for the uh, public interest. And I think unless somebody has a way of wanting to fix that, I think that's not a, an unreasonable condition. So I know Commissioner Greenberg had, uh, had her hand up. Maybe the clerk can check with the applicant if they feel the need to say anything. But what? Mr. Packer's unmuted if he's been listening. Okay. Commissioner um, yeah. What were you going to, what did you want to say before we vote on this motion? And to go to um, bed? Should I wait for Mr. Packer? Or, uh, hi, Mr. Uh, hi, this is Brett. And I'm okay. You guys can continue. Thank you Thank very you. much. Uh, appreciate that. Commissioner Greenberg. Yeah, I mean, I was just quickly going to say that 
my understanding of the spirit of that um, provision in the in the city code around co-housing along with senior housing and other things is that when it's legitimately one of those things there's some assurance that speculative potential of that kind of a development is somewhat limited um, and you know, as a result, there's some kind of trade-off where the developer of that type of housing um, would have more leeway in terms of choosing between in-lieu fees and so forth um, than a normal type of a development. But if we don't have any assurance that that's actually going to happen in the future, and I think that's part of the issue with this proposal for me, I, I totally respect the spirit of the current effort, but there is little assurance of what could happen down the road given this housing market. Um, and so I would be more comfortable knowing that it is from the get-go really going to be um, a co-housing development in order for that leeway um, in terms of inclusionary to be provided. Okay, I would uh, assume that the essence of your comments are supportive of the motion. Yes. Hey, are there any other commissioners who would like to speak to the motion on the floor? Otherwise, we'll have a roll call vote. Um, okay, um, all those in favor, why don't we have a roll call vote uh, one way or the other? Commissioner Maxwell? Aye. Conway? Aye. Spellman? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Chair Schifrin? Aye. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. The project is approved with the revised condition number 35. Um, thank you all very much. And if there are any members of the public who are still hanging in there, again, thank you so much for your testimony and putting up with what is uh, technologically challenging for all of us. Uh, and we know it's challenging for the public as well. Uh, I hope you felt, I uh, hope everyone felt that they did have a fair chance to make their views uh, known to us. Um, we have one more item on the agenda, but I'm going to recommend that we put it off till our next meeting, given the hour and the fact that we're, uh, we need another motion to continue after four more minutes. Is there any objection to continuing the 2019 general plan and housing element annual progress reports to our next meeting? Seeing none, I'll do that. Um, I don't know, uh, can we put off our subcommittee reports as well? Or did Julie, you, uh, Commissioner Conway, did you wanna say something about? I, I just wanted, uh, I wanted to check with Lee to make sure that we are, I know we're in the grace period for the general plan annual report. Um, and we can meet that by putting it off to the next meeting. We've, We've already no provided that information. That. Went to the council already. They've already oh. dealt with it. We're, we're seeing it as just to be nice. Great. Great. And and that, that was my only concern. Thank you. And I'm fine putting off a subcommittee report. Okay. And the, the council has put off um, uh, staff working on both the corridor zoning and uh, inclusionary ordinance changes, I think, until June at this point. Uh, given the workload around uh, um, the health emergency. So we'll have to wait on that. And this is really before us because legally it had to be. So uh, does the director have anything further you'd like to say? Just a couple of brief things. Um, one, uh, the city council approved the building electrification ordinance, the second reading at, the, at their last meeting. And I want to thank the commission for the comments that they provided uh, that influenced and, and really improved the ordinance um, when we brought it to council. And then um, we do have meetings scheduled um, for May 7th and then again uh, for May 21st. So we do have items lined up for both of those. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any items that anybody wants to refer to our next agenda? Future agendas? Okay, I really want to thank all the commissioners for your patience in uh, going through this. It's, it's difficult enough when we have an audience facing us, but if you, when you can't even see them and uh, you know people feel strongly about the issues, it's really challenging. So 
I appreciate everybody hanging in there and uh, our, you know, tightness and treating everybody else respectfully. So with that, I'd say we're adjourned, and uh, we'll be back on May 7th. Thank you all very much. Stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.